Hello and welcome. My name is John Horvath, and the topic of my presentation today is a primer on the behavior of expanded polystyrene as a geofoam material. This is a somewhat lengthy presentation, so I've divided it up into segments to facilitate presentation of the material in an orderly fashion, and also to facilitate your uh, viewing this presentation. You may find it easier to view it in segments to uh, fit your schedule. The word geofoam is many different things to people around the world. Uh, floor tiles, uh, cellular concrete, bedding mattresses, and shoes. So if you're a design professional or academic researcher who is using geosynthetics, you're going to have to do better than to just call it and specify it as geofoam. Unless, of course, uh, you want to risk having a surprise delivered to your project site or laboratory, uh, perhaps a pair of shoes when you were expecting something else. So it's pretty clear we need to start off with some definitions so that we understand what we're talking about and how to properly uh, call what we're talking about. The overall topic uh, of discussion are what we call cellular geosynthetics. This is a family of geosynthetic materials. Uh, these are all three-dimensional, very three-dimensional materials and products that are used in a geotechnical application. So cellular geosynthetics are in and of themselves uh, quite a bit different than traditional geosynthetics that are two-dimensional or planar. And most geosynthetics as we know them are uh, such as geotextiles, geomembranes, geogrids, metallic reinforcements of various kinds. These are certainly two-dimensional uh, for analytical purposes. Cellular geosynthetics can be closed cell foams that are created in some type of expansion process, and these are what we call geofoams. Now, geofoam actually, it turns out, was a proprietary name in the 1970s. It referred to a specific manufacturer's material that was in use on the Alagaska pipeline that was built in Alaska in the 1970s. Uh, however, the term geofoam is now generic. It's been in widespread generic use since at least 1992, and that's when I independently uh, coined the term geofoam. Uh, I only learned about the earlier use of the geofoam well after 1992. And then we have open cell cellular geosynthetics that are created in extrusion process. We call these geocombs. Uh, these are very interesting materials in their own right. They were first used in the 1990s. They appear to have been developed in France. And uh, for some peculiar reason, they've not caught on around the world. Uh, they seem fairly generic to, uh, to manufacture. Uh, these are basically just an extruded polymeric material, usually cut into panels or blocks, and have a non-woven geotextile that is factory laminated to both the upper and lower face, uh, typically. And as you can see here, being used as a part on a project in France uh, in the 1990s, uh, they are very used very similar to. Uh, EPS block geofoam that we're going to be focusing on in the presentation today. Why you would use a geocomb block, as you see here on a highway project, is that for flotation. Uh, one of the downsides of geofoams in general, because of their closed cell nature, is that they float very easily. And of course, if you were building a floating dock uh, or Similar marine structure, this is, of course, a benefit you're looking for. But if you're building a earthwork, highway embankment, for example, uh, this is not something you want to have happen. It has happened uh, inadvertently and uh, been a problem. So this is the niche that geocombs occupy, is that it, in areas where you're expecting uh, 
potential uh, changes in groundwater level because of their open cell nature, water can flow in and out readily uh, without causing flotation of the material. So actually geocombs complement, they don't replace geofoam, uh, geocombs complement geofoam. These are really complementary materials. Uh, but as I said, I've always been very surprised that uh, the world in general has not embraced geocombs more uh, than have been to date. But that's a story for another presentation. We're here today to talk about geofoams. Many different materials have been used as geofoams going back to at least 1960, if not earlier. Uh, polymeric materials, what the layperson would call plastic, we will call them polymeric materials. Vitreous materials, certainly we could have glass foams that have been used as geofoam, and cementitious uh, foams using Portland cement. Uh, so there are many, many different geofoam materials. I discussed them in the book I wrote in 1995, Geofoam Geosynthetic. It was and still is the only English language book devoted exclusively to geofoams. Uh, it has been long out of print, but it should be available either on the used market or you might be able to find it via an interlibrary loan. There was about a thousand copies of this book that were printed and uh, certainly sold around the world. So uh, there are copies out there. As we know from geosynthetics in general, for example, geotextiles, we can't just use the word geotextile by itself. We have to elaborate. Are we talking about non-woven or woven? We have to talk about the polymer that we use to make the geotextile. Well, the same thing is true about geofoams. Never ever use the word geofoam by itself in an in a engineering context. Unless, of course, as I said, you want to risk having a pair of shoes delivered to your uh, project site. Always have to elaborate on the word geofoam uh, by defining its chemical composition, polymeric, vitreous, cementaceous. If it's polymeric, the polymer chemistry. There's many different polymers have been used for geofoams. As we'll see, there are other factors as well that relate to manufacturing that sometimes need to be specified. So the bottom line is, and this will be a recurrent theme that I will emphasize throughout this presentation, is one should never use the word geofoam by itself. Now, unfortunately, that has not stopped people, especially here in the United States, from simply using the word geofoam. They think it means one type of material made in a certain way. Uh, and, and that is simply incorrect. And as I said, it can create problems on real world applications. I want to emphasize very strongly, and this is particularly for the American audience, that the word styrofoam is not and has never been a generic name for polymeric geofoam materials. Here in the United States and perhaps elsewhere, uh, we have a bad habit of calling all types of polymeric or plastic foams styrofoam. This is in the same way that we use uh, the word Kleenex generically when we really mean facial tissue or give me scotch tape when we mean cellophane tape. Unfortunately, in layperson language, uh, there are certain proprietary or trade names that have been around so long that they are used in a gem generic commodity fashion. And that's the problem with the word styrofoam. A lot of Americans use the word styrofoam to mean any type of polymeric or plastic foam. And again, a layperson could get away with that. But as we know, in civil engineering, we need to be very precise about our language. And I really emphasize this point because I have personally seen as an expert witness situations where just geofoam was specified or styrofoam was specified in a contract specification and that was not the material that was intended, but that's what they got. So styrofoam is a registered trademark for a very specific geofoam material, blue colored extruded polystyrene, or what we call XPS. Uh, very, very simple. You see a piece of plastic or polymeric foam, if it's colored blue, it's styrofoam. If it's not, it is not styrofoam. I think that's pretty easy. 
and uh, even a lay person should be able to understand that. This presentation is limited to a discussion of what we call expanded polystyrene or EPS. Uh, it's also called expanded polystyrol in Japan and perhaps other countries. And I'm also going to talk about some materials that are related to or derived from EPS. And the simple reason that I'm devoting this presentation exclusively to EPS is that it is the most widely used GFO material around the world for the last 50 years. Uh, for the vast majority of projects in which geophones are used uh, for many, many decades now, that material is going to be either expanded polystyrene or something derived from or related to it. I now want to talk about geosynthetic functions. And you see I've broken this into several uh, subtopics. The phrase designed by function has been around for several decades now and is really the overarching precept of using geosynthetics in engineered construction. Uh, designed by function is very simple. It simply means that before designing with any geosynthetic product, the design professional, the engineer or architect, she or he must have a clear understanding of what they expect that product to do. And what they expect the product to do is the function. Or as we'll see, it may be more than one function from the same product. And that's certainly possible with geophones. Now this seems ridiculously simple. Why would he even need to say design by function? It's common sense. Well, it wasn't always. I've been in professional practice since 1972. So I've been practicing as a civil and geotechnical engineer since before the word geosynthetics were used, before they were widely available. And believe me, in the early years, uh, geosynthetics were not always used in a rational fashion. Uh, it, it may seem illogical now, but it was, it certainly happened in the past. Note that design by function also means you need to have equally clear understanding of the relevant material behavior of that geosynthetic for that function. And again, this may seem very obvious. I mean, civil engineer goes to design with Portland cement, concrete, or steel. Well, they understand they have to understand, know the, the modulus, the material, the, the yield strength, the F prime C or whatever. You would think that's obvious, but again, unfortunately, with geosynthetics in general and geofoams in particular, that has not always been obvious. And so there's a reason I'm, I'm emphasizing some of these points over and over again, even early on. It's simply because in my professional career, and I've been working with geofoams since 1987. So I've been working with geofoams since before that term was widely used to uh, explain or define those materials. And I've had the opportunity to see many, many, many mistakes. And a lot of those mistakes have to do with not understanding material behavior. There are two specific aspects of geosynthetic functionality that relate to EPS geofoam that are unique to EPS geofoam and really make EPS geofoam distinctly different from all other geosynthetic materials and products. One is the inherent multifunctionality of EPS geofoam. Uh, I can't think of any other geosynthetic that has so many different functions inherently built into the material as EPS geofoam. And the majority of these functions are functions that no other geosynthetic can provide. And that's very important. I mean, we know, for example, we could use geogrids or metallic reinforcements or geotextiles uh, to provide tensile reinforcement in an earthwork. These are competing materials, geosynthetic products for that. But when it comes to EPS geofoam, it is quite unique in the functions that it provides. The other is what I call multi-strain functionality. And that is EPS geofoam has functions that are inherently what we call small strain in nature and other functions that are inherently large strain in nature. And again, that's quite unique, not only for geosynthetics, but for engineering materials in general. Uh, 
Engineering materials tend to have a single operational strain range, and that's not the case with EPS geofoam. So the bottom line is this phrase, simple phrase designed by function has unique and extraordinarily broad implications with respect to EPS as a geofoam material. And that's why I'm going through these topics, uh, because before we do anything else, we need to understand some of these unique features of EPS geofoam. And again, I, I've seen from far too many failures that simply didn't have to happen, failures that occurred because uh, the design professional involved simply didn't take the time to understand the material they were dealing with. So let's discuss these two aspects, uh, multifunctionality and multi-strain functionality a bit more. Uh, because it really provides a framework for understanding everything I'm going to talk about in the remainder of my presentation with respect to manufacturing, material behavior, and uh, standards. Well, with respect to the inherent multifunctionality of EPS geofoam, one of the things people don't think about in general is that you always need to consider what I call the passive functions of the material. And again, EPS geofoam can provide many, many functions, and it does this inherently. And the bottom line is those functions are going to be there whether you're going to call on them in your particular application or not. And sometimes these other functions that are kind of lurking in the background, if you will, can have some unintended con consequences. So we need to think them through during the design process. The best way to illustrate this is to go through an example. Uh, classic example would be using EPS geofoam as a lightweight film material, which is for many, many decades now, the most commonly used geofoam function by far. It's been used since about 1972, so we've been using EPS as a lightweight fill material uh, for the function of lightweight fill for about 50 years now. But we also need to remember that EPS is inherently an outstanding thermal insulative material. And as we'll see in the next section on history, that uh, this is what it was originally developed for. Specifically, a unit thickness of EPS has the same thermal resistivity of about 30 to 40 unit thicknesses of soil. What I'm saying here is that, uh, say, one foot of EPS geofoam has the same thermal resistance of 30 to 40 feet of soil. One meter of EPS, 30 to 40 meters of soil. So uh, rather remarkable thermal resistivity. And you can't turn this thermal resistant behavior off. So even if you're designing a lightweight fill, you're not particularly looking for a thermal insulator. Well, you're going to get it whether you like it or not. And because you can't turn off that capability or ability of EPS. So you need to design with that in mind. In particular, uh, you need to recognize that the mass of EPS geofoam that you're using for a lightweight fill is really going to impact the heat flow regime in the ground. And we've learned from unfortunate experience that can have negative consequences. Uh, for example, when you use EPS geofoam as part of an earthwork as a lightweight fill beneath any type of pavement uh, for a roadway, uh, a walkway, uh, airfield pavement. In any climate that is subject subject to even even near freezing air temperatures, you don't have to even go below freezing to have this problem. You can have this phenomenon that is known as differential icing. And what this means is, as we know, the ground surface is subject to a very complex heat flux regime. Uh, you have heat fluxes during the day, you have heat fluxes at night. Uh, so you have a very, very complex number of different mechanisms with a net 
that you have a heat flux being input into the ground. Well, you also have what is called the geothermal heat flux. It's simply the heat from the center of the earth that is moving upward and outward. Now, these are, of course, going to be in balance and in areas especially where the temperature may vary substantially during the course of the year, the more temperate climates, uh, this heat flux is, is very, very dynamic. These heat flux is going to vary during the course of the day. It's going to vary with the time of the year. Well, if you now come along and put a mass of EPS geofoam in there as a lightweight fill for a road embankment, you're now putting in a very, very efficient thermal insulator. It is going to have a tectonic uh, impact on this natural heat balance, this give and take between the Earth's atmosphere and the interior of the Earth. You're, you're going to disrupt this balance rather significantly. Now, that's not your intention. You're looking for this to be a lightweight fill because you're building an embankment on soft ground and want to limit the settlements. But my point is, is you're going to need to consider the effect of your lightweight fill on this heat flux, whether you like it or not. Because you have the potential to create differential icing. Uh, here's just a case history from early in the use of uh, polystyrene geofoams is geofoam materials where you have a classical black ice condition developing. And this was black ice developing in a situation where ice was not anticipated. Uh, the very, very strange thing about the development of differential icing is you could have a situation where the air temperature is above freezing. And it's important to remember that when you, you know, you look at weather information, you see, oh, here's the, the air temperature. The air temperature is measured at some standard height above the ground, uh, typically five feet, about one and a half meters above the ground in the shade. So the air temperature is really the air temperature at some distance above the ground surface. You can actually have a situation where the air temperature is above freezing, yet the ground surface is below freezing. And any humidity in the air will condense on that ground surface and freeze, forming black ice. I'm sure many of us who live in temperate climates come out in the morning to your car that may be parked in the driveway and you see a light white coating of hoarfrost on the vehicle. Uh, that's an example of this. Uh, because the rubber tires of the vehicle are a great insulator, the metal body of the vehicle can get colder than the air temperature, cause humidity in the air to condense and freeze. So uh, this is a real problem. Because if this freezing occurs when the air temperature is above zero, obviously the highway department is not going to be out there with its salt trucks. They're going to say, well, the air temperature is above freezing. Why do we need to salt the road? So this differential icing can be a real problem. Uh, I did a research report on this about 20 years ago, and I want to point out during the course of this presentation, I will note a number of uh, research reports and other documents and these can all be downloaded uh, at no cost in PDF file format from my ResearchGate uh, webpage. So you'll see this uh, kind of reference used several times throughout this presentation. So you may want to take a look at this report I wrote about 20 years ago that discusses this differential icing issue in more detail. Moving on now to multi-strain functionality. Uh, as I said earlier, most materials and products that we use in engineer construction, and geosynthetics in particular, are meant to be used for a very narrow range and strain under design loads or service loads. So, I mean, Portland cement, concrete, structural steel, these are used in a very narrow strain range for routine design. And certainly this is true with geosynthetics, for example, when we use geogrids as part of mechanically stabilized uh, earth wall, we assume that there'll be a maximum tensile strain value 
and that's used to define the operative stiffness or modulus of that geogrid product. Well, EPS geofoam is unique in that it's different functions, and again, it has many, many functions, uh, most of them unique to EPS geofoam, where the operative strain ranges are quite different. The majority of EPS geofoam functions are what we call small strain applications. And this is because we keep the compressive normal strains relatively small, and 1% is a maximum that's very convenient to use in practice. And later on, when I talk about material properties, we'll see where this 1% value comes from. And the reason we keep this to a small strain is to prevent serviceability issues uh, due to excessive settlement, especially when we have an overlying structure or a pavement or a railway track system, something like that. So this includes the very common functions such as lightweight fill that I've already mentioned, uh, thermal insulation beneath pavements, and small amplitude vibration and noise attenuation. However, we increasingly are using EPS geofoam functions that are fundamentally what we call large strain in nature. And these large strain functions don't have a specific single strain range, but they're typically double digits, 10, 20, 30, 40, even 50 percent strain. And that's really quite unique. I mean, I really offhand can't think of a lot of applications in civil engineering where we intentionally want the material to strain 20, 30, 40 percent. And yet when we do that with EPS geofoam and large strain applications, that's the norm. And this is primarily at this time the function of what we call compressible inclusion. Uh, this is for earth pressure reduction, both lateral earth pressures behind rigid earth retaining structures. Uh, and you may hear this called a seismic buffer. This term seismic buffer is a term that some people have dreamt up in recent years. A seismic buffer is simply EPS geofoam used as a compressible inclusion under seismic loading. So seismic buffer is just a special application of the compressible inclusion function uh, to reduce seismic induced loads on earth retaining structures. We can also use compressible inclusions uh, to induce vertical settlements and this is when we want to reduce vertical stresses on underground conduits uh, to induce arching over the conduit or beneath structural slabs when we have expansive soils and rocks and we want to reduce the uplift pressures on a structural slab. These are all the compressible inclusion function. As I said, it's typical that we intentionally design the geofoam product to strain 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% in these applications. So to summarize, uh, there's a lot of things about EPS as geofoam material that require paradigm shift in thinking compared to all other geosynthetic products. And in fact, I can extend this and say perhaps uh, civil engineering materials in general. First and foremost is there is no one EPS geofoam product that's the optimal one to use. And optimal in this case means a, a combination of performance and cost. All right, we really need to understand that we need to keep cost in mind. Without getting into specific numbers, because it's impossible to put single valued numbers on things, as we'll see, there's too much volatility in EPS cost. Uh, I mean, EPS geofoam is more expensive than soil. So we need, we need to consider the cost of this material uh, as we do in any engineering design. I mean, we know in design, I mean, it's, it's the old joke uh, here in the United States for many, many years now. You know, a civil engineer is someone who could do for a dollar what a lay person could do for $10. And there's a certain element of truth there. And that is that in engineered construction, uh, 
we as design professionals need to keep in mind not only the technical side of things, but the cost side of things. We need to always balance these things to come up with an optimal result. And the reason I'm emphasizing this so strongly is that there is a really uh, a perception, and I'm hesitating here because I can't understand why, that there's this perception that one size fits all, particularly that what we call block molded EPS or EPS block. I'll, I'll define this more exactly a little bit later in the presentation. Block molded EPS is not the solution to every problem. And unfortunately, more people than not think it is. They think that, well, there's, a lot of people think there is only one EPS geophone product. You buy it in big blocks. Now, whether you use it as a lightweight fill or you use it as a compressible inclusion uh, above an underground conduit, it's the same product, one size fits all. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, think to whether you're designing with steel or Portland cement concrete or, or wood, timber, there's no one size fits all, right? There's no one type, there, we don't, there's not one size of wide flange beam that is used for every steel application, is there? No, of course not. Well, there's no one type of geophone material and product that's the best to use in every application. And again, I emphasize this for a reason. And the reason is because in the uh, over 30 years that I've been working with geophones and geocombs and cellular geosynthetics in general uh, now, that a lot of end users, uh, both design professionals and, and academic researchers, have failed to understand this. And, and I base this conclusion on published work, not just on hearsay or my imagination. If I look at what people have published, I, I just see that a lot of inappropriate materials are being used. And, and I've written about this. I wrote a paper about this a decade ago. Um, this happened to be from one particular application uh, because that was the theme of the ASCE conference on earth retaining structures. So this just talked about uh, both academicians and, and design professionals not using uh, EPS geophone materials properly to reduce lateral earth pressures on earth retaining structures. But we could extend this to many other applications as well. I place part of this blame, quite bluntly, on the EPS industry, at least here in the United States. They've really not been helpful in trying to correct these misunderstandings. And that's because EPS industry, at least in the U.S., is really interested in selling volume. It's a volume-based business. And I'm going to talk about the history of the business uh, in a minute because it's really important to understand the history of expanded polystyrene, to understand the the way that the industry and, and many people uh, think about it. Uh, as I said, I've been in engineering practice now for almost 50 years, and the improper use of EPS geophone materials and products really reminds me of the early days of planar geosynthetics, you know, geotextiles, geomembranes, geogrids, when people were using the wrong product or they used it in the wrong way, and, and they developed uh, some incorrect or misleading conclusions from doing this. I, I can remember on a very early project in the 1970s uh, here in the United States, I happened to be out in the field that day visiting the project site, and the contractor bought a roll of this newfangled thing called filter fabric, which, as we know, was the old, older name for geotextile. And he bought a roll of this and placed it on the ground, and we were all standing around, a bunch of us, uh, the owner, uh, the contractor, my field engineer, me, and we were all looking at this. You know, we'd heard of this stuff. We are all looking at it. And, and it's almost, it, I think back on it, it was almost ludicrous. It's almost like we were expecting it to get up and dance or do something magical. Uh, the reality is with geosynthetics, they're only magical in what they do if the design professional or academic researcher understands the material, knows what function they want to use it for, knows the material properties, 
and then uses the function or functions and properties in a very clever, innovative way. That's where the magic of geosynthetics comes in. It's not from the inherently in the material. It's how an educated professional uses it in a knowledgeable, educated way. Uh, and, and as I said, I, I've been in this business long enough to know I've seen a lot of new materials and products come and some of them go that um, some of these early experiences, uh, these incorrect and misleading conclusions can really hurt rather than help a geotechnology in the long run. You know, people develop a certain mindset that, well, I tried that, it didn't work, you know, I'm never going to use it again. So in summary, successful design with EPS geoform requires you have to have a very clear definition of the function or functions that you're looking for in a specific application. And you need to understand the material behavior that's relevant for those functions and applications. You need to select the most cost effective as well as technically appropriate product. And it may well be something other than uh, just EPS block. If the product you select is generic, a commodity, then you need to have the appropriate standard uh, to reference in order to develop a project specific uh, specification. If it's a proprietary product, then you really need to pressure the manufacturer supplier to provide all the relevant material properties. Uh, it's incumbent upon the manufacturer supplier to give you what you need to do your work. But whether a generic or proprietary material product, you need to have a, what I call a robust independent third party manufacturing quality assurance program. And that's got to be in place throughout construction from beginning to end, big project or small. Trust, hope, and luck are not rational strategies in engineer construction. And again, I'm emphasizing this and highlighting it in red because I, I've really seen, I've seen failures from this uh, related to EPS geophone. Uh, never ever rely on just somebody's, some supplier or manufacturer say so that their product, yeah, yeah, it'll do the job. Uh, you need to have independent uh, quality assurance testing to verify the material. And again, this is not just a big project strategy. This needs to be done on even the smallest of projects. Well, I now want to talk about the history of, of expanded polystyrene, and I think this is very important. Uh, because there are some unique aspects related to other geosynthetics. And again, I've divided this up into several subtopics. I've mentioned that expanded polystyrene is unique as a geosynthetic material from a functionality uh, perspective, uh, but there's another unique aspect, and that is that um, the way EPS came to be. And it's important to understand the origins of expanded polystyrene because it really impacts every aspect from manufacturing, material behavior, standards, and above all sales, as I uh, alluded to earlier. And this is because expanded polystyrene was invented and around for a long time in widespread commercial use in non-geotechnical above-ground construction applications long before the word geosynthetics was coined and long before it began to be used as a geosynthetic material. Uh, even in the present, even though we've been using expanded polystyrene and geofoam applications now for several decades, the geofoam market is, in general, a very minor percentage of the overall global market of EPS products, certainly here in the United States. So 
If we look at the entire volume of expanded polystyrene that is manufactured and used around the world in general, and the U.S. in particular, uh, the GFO market is a very small part of that. And I think it's important to understand because I found that certainly here in the U.S., uh, geofoam applications are really at the back of the line, as I said, call it, when it comes to getting industry attention for R&D. Uh, if I look at over the last several decades, again, I've been involved with expanded polystyrene as a geofoam material since 1987. If I look at where the industry has put its research money in terms of uh, applications, things like that, it has not been in geofoam applications. It's been in areas where they think they can sell more product and make more money. I found here in the United States that there are even some EPS manufacturers who will not only not actively pursue, they won't even sell to the geofoam market. I could recall going to a manufacturer here in the northeastern U.S. and say they, they just would not, even if you asked them, they would not sell to a geofoam project they perceive it to be a nuisance. It's a, to them, it's a nuisance sales niche. You know, a lot of these manufacturers have, again, EPS is used for so many different uh, products and applications. And, you know, these manufacturers have been, you know, they have uh, customers that come to them day in, day out, year round. And, and their business is really set up to, uh, to servicing that customer base. And, you know, somebody strolls in and wants a whole bunch of EPS for a geofoam project. In a lot of ways, it's a nuisance to them. It's very disruptive. And, and for what modest amount of money they might make on it, they're not interested in. And this is because projects that use EPS as geofoam material tend to be unpredictable. It depends on when a project uh, goes out to bid or some owner decides to build it. Uh, very episodic. Uh, and they're very demanding production-wise. Uh, most GF, EPS geofoam projects tend to require large volume material. It has to be very high quality, as I'll elaborate on several times throughout this presentation, and in a short time frame. You know, somebody comes in unexpected one day and says, I want a whole bunch of material, I want it yesterday, and boy, it's got to be the best thing you ever made. And this can really overwhelm a manufacturer. Uh, you know, here we are worldwide in the middle of a pandemic uh, related to uh, COVID-19, and we see how supply chains for, uh, for food and paper goods and other things have been really disrupted by the change in lifestyle of, of people around the world. Well, that, that's, that's kind of similar to what happens with an EPS manufacturer. You know, as they say, the EPS manufacturers, they're set up for this kind of routine day in, day out sales to different customers they have that are around all the time. Somebody comes in and wants to basically buy up all their production and then some for the next few weeks. It's very disruptive. And let's be honest here. Human nature is human nature. And when manufacturers get pressed on things, corners are cut. I'm not saying it's malicious. I'm not saying people are out to intentionally do harm. It is just human nature. If you press people to do things in a rush, in a hurry, they're going to cut corners to meet that demand. And that's just the way it is. And I, I think we need to be honest about that. And again, I'm bringing this up because I've seen more than a few EPS GFOM projects here in the United States where, quite honestly, corners were cut to meet demand. Um, and in a few cases, there were failures that resulted from it. Well, I'm emphasizing these different aspects of expanded polystyrene because if you think about it, these are quite different than other geosynthetics, especially the planar products such as geotextiles and geogrids. I mean, geogrids were developed specifically with geotechnical applications in mind. Um, and the companies that develop these products have always been geo-oriented and geo-dependent from day one. I mean, for example, we look at the Reinforced Earth Company. Uh, I just mentioned them because it was a company that was developed 
originally with one th thing to sell metallic reinforcements for earth retaining structures and in the early days they put a lot of money into R&D to develop uh, their concept to make people comfortable with using their materials and their concept so and this is true with most other geosynthetics in general uh, the vast majority of planar geosynthetics whether textiles or grids or or geomembranes uh, the companies that that manufacture these products have put a lot of money into R&D and organizations that promote R&D and that's simply very different than EPS where the GFO market is has always been a really small piece of the overall pie so the point I'm getting at is there was a very well established EPS industry culture certainly in the United States I could speak with that from a first hand basis uh, to viewing EPS past and present as a non geotechnical construction material uh, in for walls and buildings and in roof of a flat roof building as well as for uh, consumer industrial applications food and beverage containers cushion packaging and you know it's very difficult to change a culture that has been established for many many decades so there are artifacts of this non geofoam reality of expanded polystyrene that really remain embedded in the entire spectrum of EPS manufacturing its material behavior creating standards for commodity generic products uh, and it's really retarded the industry from at least in the US from wanting to develop EPS products that are tailored to geofoam applications uh, you know it's it's there are some countries especially the United Kingdom that have shown that I mean you you could make an expanded polystyrene product that is specifically for a geofoam application has no other application other than geofoam application but of course it takes investment to do this and the vast majority of countries especially the US has been loath to do this so I'm going to trace the development history of EPS and its non geotechnical use so that you understand uh, the background of, of what I'm talking about here Uh, EPS was invented around 1950 in what was then West Germany uh, by uh, Badische Anlund und Zoda Fabrik, Aktien Gesellschaft, uh, BASF, which is a multinational uh, company, uh, makes many, many petrochemical products around the world. And by the way, in the course of this uh, presentation if I happen to mention a particular business name or a trade name uh, I'm, I'm not plugging that material or product I'm trying to be objective here but you know in, in an informational objective way sometimes you need to mention specific materials and products like I mentioned styrofoam uh, you know it's a fact of life I mean it's as we'll see it was invented or developed by the uh, Dow Chemical Company that's just a statement of fact it's not to push the material or the company or anything like that so really from the beginning of the 1950s the primary use of EPS was as thermal insulation in above ground applications uh, exterior walls of buildings flat roofs of buildings especially industrial buildings things like that there are several key uh, technical issues of such non geotechnical applications first and foremost is that in above ground thermal insulation applications generally there's little or no load bearing on the product once it's installed I mean if you have a panel of expanded polystyrene between the studs of a wall other than holding itself up it's not doing any load bearing if you put it on the flat roof of a building it really other than having some membrane placed on top of it it's it's not doing anything but holding itself up so really the EPS product only needs to be sufficiently strong if you will to be able to handle it so that it doesn't break apart 
during construction or shipment. And, and that's a real possibility with EPS, as we'll see. It's the trapped gas within the closed cells of the EPS, uh, which is air in the case of EPS, at least in the long term, that provides thermal resistance. In any thermally resistant material, it's really the pockets of gas that are trapped in the material that's providing the thermal resistance. That's important because what it means is when you have a closed cell foam such as EPS, the goal is to make the lowest density material practical. Because the lowest density material is going to have the largest relative volume of gas filled cells. The more gas filled cells, in general, the better the thermal insulation properties. Uh, the raw, raw material used to make EPS is petroleum-based. It comes from crude oil, if you will. And as we know, the market price of a barrel of oil can, can really vary all over the place and very quickly. Uh, there's certainly in recent, the last 50 years, there's been enormous volatility in the price of a barrel of oil. And that's going to be reflected in the price of EPS. Uh, Raw materials make up a majority of the cost of final uh, EPS. If you buy an EPS product and that product costs uh, so many dollars or so many euro or whatever uh, per cubic foot or cubic meter, more than 50% of that unit cost simply reflects the cost of the raw material, which as we'll see, all relates back to crude oil or petroleum. The point I'm getting at here is that because of the cost of raw materials, one wants to, when you make EPS, use as little raw materials possible, the lowest density product possible to minimize production costs. And when you use this uh, as thermal insulation in above ground applications, usually using thin panels or sheets, we're talking about things that are a few inches or tens of millimeters thick. And these are factory cut from a much thicker block uh, and the blocks in the EPS industry are called billets. Uh, although you do, I have found in the last several years that the industry is getting away from using the term billet and, and does use block more often. Well, the bottom line and the reason for emphasizing these things is that the EPS industry and certainly here in the United States has historically, and again, going back to the 1950s, focused primarily on material density. Now here in the United States, really we use unit weight, pounds per cubic foot. Uh, throughout the rest of the world, you will see it properly expressed as a density, kilograms per cubic meter. But here in the United States, we use unit weight, or wherever we use imperial units. It's a unit weight, but they're still incorrectly called density. So if you look at the product literature of a U.S. EPS manufacturer, they say, oh, the density is so many pounds per cubic foot. Well, that's not really density. That's the unit weight, but they'll still incorrectly call it density. I'm emphasizing this because we know as civil engineers, density and unit weight are not the same thing. To a layperson, yeah, they can get away with calling them the same thing. We cannot. And especially since we use EPS, uh, geofoam, in both static and dynamic applications. Static applications, we're interested in unit weight. Dynamic applications, we're interested in density. So we need to be careful here. Uh, you, you'll see the EPS industry talk about compressive and fluctual resistance, but this is just for very small uh, laboratory test specimens. And this is these are really just secondary metrics. Uh, and that's so that the thin panels of EPS don't break apart as they're being shipped and handled. Uh, it's really a, a durability issue. There's another issue we need to know and that impacts uh, geosynthetic material, uh, EPS as a geosynthetic material in the US. This is business, not technical related. Everything I've talked about up to this point has been technical related. And that is just before World War II and therefore prior to the development of EPS by over a decade, there was an alternative closed cell polystyrene foam was invented in Sweden. 
And this material is now called extruded polystyrene or XPS. So we have EPS and we have XPS. They're both polystyrene closed cell foams, but they are manufactured in completely different ways. As we'll see, EPS is made in discrete blocks or billets, whereas XPS is made in a continuous thread, if you will. Uh, and extruded polystyrene was made famous, certainly here in the United States, by the Dow Chemical Company. They acquired uh, Carl Munter's IP and produced the material under the trade name Styrofoam, and as they say, the rest is history. So styrofoam is one of the earliest polymeric foams, and, and that's why Americans have gotten into the bad habit of calling every type of polymeric or plastic foam styrofoam. It's, it's simply just about the oldest one that's been around. But again, very simple. If you see a piece of polymeric or plastic foam, if it's colored blue, then it's styrofoam. If it's not colored blue, then it is not. Here in the United States, XPS tends to be either blue, green, pink, or yellow. Uh, these are simply color additives. They're not native to the material. Uh, outside the United States, uh, the XPS I've seen, for example, made in Japan, uh, tends to be kind of like a very light tan, almost beige material. So the, the color that you see here in the United States, as I said, blue, green, pink, yellow, that's just an artificial color introduced in the manufacturing process for product identification and marketing purposes. It has nothing to do with the product itself. Uh, I've already, I think I've made the point that uh, styrofoam is not a generic term. Uh, and we have to be very careful of that as design professionals, civil engineers and architects, that we don't use the word styrofoam, unless we specifically mean the blue colored XPS from Dow Chemical, then you can call it styrofoam. If you want something else, then you gotta call it something else. Well, the point of bringing up XPS is that since the 1950s, they've been really fierce competitors here in the US for this above ground insulation of walls of buildings, uh, roofs of buildings, things like that. And also in more recent decades uh, for some nominally geotechnical applications such as the below grade insulation of exterior walls of uh, houses and condos and things like that, residential construction. Well, this led to ASTM developing a standard C578, which goes back many, many decades now. And to keep everybody happy, this one standard covers both EPS and XPS for these above ground thermal insulation applications, but it mentions neither. And it simply refers to these materials generically as rigid cellular polystyrene. And if you look at the C578 standard, you will never see the words EPS and XPS. And if you look at the materials in there, unless you really know the numbers to look at, you can't tell which material is which. So in summary, uh, the EPS industry, at least here in the United States, and the ASTM standards that have been developed by the industry have for over 50 years focused on the non-load bearing applications of EPS as thermal insulation. And in those applications, only material density and thermal conductivity, or here in the United States, we tend to use the re reciprocal thermal resistivity that's what R value is. I mean, even lay persons have heard of R value. Oh, this material is this R value, so many R's per inch. R value is just a thermal resistivity. Uh, I know that in Europe, they tend to use thermal conductivity. I've seen the lowercase Greek letter lambda used quite often uh, for thermal conductivity. So whether you express it as thermal conductivity or thermal resistivity, that's really the focus, right? So density and thermal properties are the paramount importance. And the industry, at least here in the US, is largely based on selling the largest volume for the lowest possible unit cost. 
and really the the EPS industry in the United States has been fine-tuned to this market all right they, they've really squeezed all the efficiencies they can out of this as they have to because they're selling a commodity generic product it's a kind of classic, what I call commodity product market. And this is when you have a whole bunch of different manufacturers that are essentially making the same thing. Now, you will find a lot of manufacturers will give their product a unique name because they want you to think it's unique to them. Well, the name's unique to them, but the product is the exact same as their competitor down the road is making. So when you have a commodity product, whether you're making facial tissue, or toilet paper, or cellophane tape, or anything else, paper clips, whatever, when you're making a commodity product, you really, who wins and who loses is really based on production cost. Who can just meet the standards for that product at the lowest cost? That, that's going to be the companies that survive. And I think it's very important for us as design professionals or academic researchers, and believe me, in my 48-year year career, I've been both and am both. Um, it's important to understand the, the industry that we're dealing with. The, the, the EPS industry is very different from all the other geosynthetic industries that we deal with. So this is, this is really the setting that we as geotechnical engineers stepped into when EPS began to be used very widely here in the United States and elsewhere throughout the world, uh, really beginning in the 1990s. That's when we see the rapid rise in the use of EPS as a geofoam material. As I said, it was around as pavement insulation going back to 1960. Uh, the late professor Jerry Leonards at, uh, who was at Purdue University for many decades uh, took out a patent in the 1960s for the use of uh, polystyrene foams as pavement insulation. So we've, we've been using these materials in geofoam applications since 1960 for pavement insulation, since at least 1972 for lightweight fill. But at least here in the United States, it's really 1990s when the market really just took off. Well, the reason I'm emphasizing this history uh, of EPS uh, for a variety of reasons, but one of them is that EPS geofoam applications are load-bearing in nature. Uh, and even when the primary function is thermal insulation and is insulated pavements or insulated railway track systems, there's going to be very significant load-bearing on that geofoam product in place. So more contrast to the history of EPS as a construction material with in no non-load bearing. Also, when we use in most EPS geofoam applications, especially lightweight fills, we use full-size blocks, uh, we, that, and they're an order of magnitude thicker than the panels you're going to use in the wall of a building, for example. So in EPS geofoam applications, it's really the material stiffness or modulus under applied loads, not the density per se, and it's the stiffness of full-size block that really is of the most important material property. And, and this is a real paradigm shift to what the EPS industry around the world is used to. And I emphasize this, highlight this, EPS density is not a reliable metric for EPS stiffness or modulus. I emphasize this because a lot of people think it's based on what they've read or somebody has told them that, oh, if you want to know how much load you can put on EPS, it depends on the density. No, it does not. And I'm going to show you why. A very simple reason is that there's a lot of ways to what I call game the system. Uh, I'm going to go through the manufacturing of EPS in some detail, and you can see, boy, there's a lot of steps along the way where you can tinker with the process, you could do things, and in the end, you can wind up with materials that may have the same density, 
but vary all over the place in terms of load bearing. You know, I've seen EPS that has a certain density that'll just break apart in your hand like crumbs. So density is not, never has been a reliable, emphasis on reliable metric for the load bearing capacity of expanded polystyrene. Bottom line is that the GFO market for EPS is a real shift in thinking for EPS manufacturers. I've been dealing with EPS manufacturers oh, since the early 1990s here in the United States and, and other countries. Uh, I've been to South America, I've been to Japan. So I, I've met EPS manufacturers from Europe, Western Europe, I mean, the Netherlands, uh, Germany, South America, uh, Chile, Uruguay, uh, Argentina, Japan. Uh, and EPS GFOM was a real shift in thinking for them. You know, here in the United States, we have a saying, something isn't rocket science. And it's a, and it's a colloquial expression meant to indicate that, well, you know, it's no big deal to make this. It's not rocket science. You know, you, you don't have to pay attention to it. Well, the fact of life is, as far as EPS is concerned, the GFO market is rocket science. The GFO market is about as tough as it could get for an EPS manufacturer. It requires a lot more manufacturing detail. They got to focus on material stiffness, which, believe me, as I said, I've been dealing with EPS manufacturers since the early 90s. Uh, if you want to see somebody give you that deer in the headlight look like they don't know what you're talking about, just start throwing around words like Young's modulus and shear modulus and, uh, and yield stress and you've lost them. So the GFO market is very high quality EPS. It's very different from what manufacturers are typically using. Well, let's talk about the manufacturing process because understanding the manufacturing process is really key to understanding why, first and foremost, density is not a reliable metric for the load bearing capacity of EPS. Now, the manufacturing of EPS is a very complex multi-step process. I wrote this research report about a decade ago uh, I would suggest that uh, you get a copy and read it. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief overview in the presentation here today. This report goes into a lot more detail on all the different subjects I'm going to be talking about. Okay. The Basic EPS product used in any application, not just VFO, is the end result of four distinct production steps that involve multiple business entities. Uh, although the end user typically only ever deals with the final business entity, uh, each can have a significant financial and uh, te technical impact on the final product. So it's, it's useful to redo, uh, review each of these four uh, steps in some detail. Well, first of all, the fundamental origin of EPS is petroleum, or crude oil, as it's called colloquially. And this comes from a petroleum producer or oil company, uh, which nowadays, of course, can be anywhere in the world. I mentioned this uh, earlier on because this, the fact that petroleum is the base product of EPS is reflected in the uh, price volatility of EPS, uh, which just said that. Uh, and the reason I'm emphasizing this cost volatility is that it's not unusual on large projects where the EPS geofoam and material delivery can be spread out over months or even years. I've been involved with projects where the uh, deliveries are spread out over years. And one needs to be sensitive to this. And, and when writing a 
uh, project specification, if you're going to have a project of extended duration, you may want to include some sort of language for cost volatility in there. And, and this is not uncommon. For example, in the United States, it's been common for some time now in contracts that involve asphalt paving, where the uh, paving may go on over a period of months or years on a project that the price of asphalt can be very volatile. And in all fairness to the contractor, uh, I mean, you don't want them guessing what the price of oil is going to be uh, six months or a year from now. I mean, just look at this past year. Now, granted, this past year has been extraordinary because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, but the price of oil has been all over the place in, over the past year. So in some of the standards that I will talk about towards the end of my presentation, uh, I've actually developed a model for allowing for cost volatility of EPS as a GFO material. The second step is the production of what is called styrene monomer. Uh, now styrene is, interestingly enough, is actually found naturally in things as diverse as coffee beans and peanuts but certainly in the quantity and quality that is required for EPS, it's an artificial uh, product made using uh, petroleum. And this is done by a chemical company. And while this company can be located anywhere in the world, there are some issues. Uh, uh, and that's because shipping styrene monomer needs to be uh, temperature controlled to ensure its uh, stability. So you there are some pragmatic limitations on shipping styrene monomer over long distances uh, and keeping it stable. The third step in production uh, is the basic raw material used to make EPS, and this is called expandable polystyrene. You'll also hear it colloquially called beads or resin. Uh, I will call it beads. It seems to be common here in the U.S. And this is made by a resin supplier, which is another chemical company that can be anywhere in the world. The production of beads uh, involves the polymerization of the styrene monomer. Basically connecting, if we think of a styrene, a monomer is basically a link in a chain. Polymerization is linking all those links together. Uh, there's also the addition of what is called a blowing agent, which is typically a mixture of pentane gases. Uh, essentially what we're doing here is we're taking a petroleum hydrocarbon gas, we're dissolving it into the beads. Uh, with the idea, as we'll see later on, we're going to add heat and that's going to turn this into back into a gas and cause expansion. So the blowing agent is essentially the additive. It's usually a few percent by volume that uh, will activate the material later on, if you will. At this stage, it's also optional to add a flame retardant, which is typically some bromine based compound. Uh, but this is done only, only if this the EPS is intended for non-food applications. Uh, this bromine compound will leach out of the EPS over time. And to be kind about it, it's, it's not good for your health, let's put it that way. So certainly if you're going to use the EPS for some kind of food container, liquid or solid, you don't want this happening. Um, there are some countries, especially in Scandinavia, they tend not to use the flame retardant at all, uh, even when it's going to be in a construction application. Much of the rest of the world, certainly here in the United States, it is common to do this. Uh, and this is because polystyrene is inherently flammable in air. Uh, the parameter that's focused on is called the oxygen index. Uh, and it reflects the fact that there's uh, what about 21% uh, oxygen in uh, normal atmospheric air and the oxygen index of polystyrene is around 18. What that means is polystyrene only needs about 18% oxygen 
in a mixture of gases to burn uh, or sustain a flame. Well, 21% is in air. Obviously, it's going to sustain a flame pretty easily. So it, basically, the flame retardant is to up the oxygen index above 21, usually somewhere around 25, something like that. And uh, but again, it, it does. It's not a fireproof. It's a flame retardant. Very important to understand that. Now, my question about why, if we're going to bury the EPS in the ground, is geofoam, do we need a flame retardant? Uh, really pragmatic. Um, one is for safety during handling and storage. Uh, the other is uh, a because uh, EPS manufacturers, that's the fourth step we'll talk about in a minute, are certainly here in the US typically only use flame retardant material. If they were to use non-flame retardant beads, it would contaminate their manufacturing system and they really would not be interested in that. Uh, this has become much more contentious in recent years, uh, concerned about this leaching out over time and being a health hazard. Um, I would not be surprised if more is made of this in the future, especially in Europe. The Europeans seem to lead nowadays when it comes to uh, environmental issues related to chemicals. Uh, moving on, bees have the particle size of medium to fine sand to relate it to a geotechnical uh, topic. And uh, the resident suppliers sort out and sell the beads by size range. The important thing is that these bees have a, a finite shelf life. You know, just like you see on a, a food product, you know, must sell by or best if used by date. Well, there's a similar best if used by date on beads. And it's simply because even with packaging, the blowing agent is going to evaporate out of the beads over time. A note that the beads are inherently white in color, and this is why the final EPS product is inherently white in color. However, a colorant can be added during bead production. In addition to the blowing agent and the flame retardant chemical, if you want to produce a final EPS product that is colored. Now, in my experience, colored EPS is rare to the point of being almost non-existent in the United States. I think part of it is because the common colors, uh, blue, green, pink, and yellow, uh, have long since been taken over by extruded polystyrene manufacturers. However, outside the United States, it is more common uh, to see a colored uh, EPS. In fact, I've seen countries where they actually make a EPS product for geofoam applications that's colored brown, for example. So uh, the point is, is that color is, is certainly an optional issue with polystyrene foams in general. I like to use food analogies when I talk about making EPS. It's, it's I guess it's, it's part, a large part of my lecturing about EPS that goes back to the early 1990s has been to non-engineering audiences. So... Anyone who's ever had to speak to a non-technical audience knows that if you can relate to things that are common or they might know about, uh, they'll get much more out of your presentation. So I, I liken the manufacture of EPS to different food production, specifically popcorn. So if we think about popcorn, these are the kernels that are going to be popped into popcorn. And think of EPS beads or resin, expandable polystyrene as being these kernels of unpopped popcorn. And in fact, in these kernels, the blowing agent is water. Okay. When a company makes uh, kernels uh, of corn for popping, there's a very specific range in water content. Because they've learned from experience and testing that if you want to pop these kernels so that the vast majority of them pop, they've got to have a certain water content. And in fact, that water content can evaporate over time. So you can have popcorn popping kernels that are too old to pop because the water has evaporated. So 
blowing agent is to EPS beads what water is to the kernels of popping corn. Okay, well, let's move on to the fourth and final production step, which is done by what is called a molder. And EPS must be made in a fixed plant. And I emphasize this because there are polymeric foams. Uh, polyurethane, for example. I'm sure many of us has bought that uh, little can in a hardware store or something, a uh, spray can of foam to use as sealing up cracks or th things like that in walls. So there are polymeric foams that could be kind of foamed in place. Uh, EPS is not one of them. You need a fixed plan for this, and you'll see why in a second. So the molder is really the business entity with whom end users typically deal when you're purchasing EPS products. Uh, unless you're buying a product that a molder has sold through a distributor, material supplier, or retail store. So you could go into one of these big box stores, uh, like a Home Depot or Lowe's or something like that, and you will actually see panels of EPS available for purchase uh, for use in uh, insulation in a wall, for example, or a ceiling. And as we know with geosynthetics in general, a lot of geosynthetics are sold through a distributor or material supplier. This has not worked out well, at least in the United States. Uh, and that's simply because a distributor or material supplier has to add, obviously, a markup uh, for their services. So for EPS GFOM products, at least here in the U.S., typically you'll find that the construction contractor will purchase the EPS directly from an EPS molder. And this is really to minimize costs. Um, as simply as what has worked out well. It, it could very well be different in other countries. In other countries, you may find that the EPS for the GFO market is sold through distributor or material supplier. And, and you will see that in the United States. So there are construction material distributors or material suppliers that will sell EPS for the GFO market. But recognize you're paying for that privilege. While the EPS molder is the greatest influence by far on the quality of the final product, uh, so we're going to talk about the EPS molding and molding process in quite a bit much more detail than the other steps. So the EPS molding process begins with the molder purchasing the beads, the raw material from a resin supplier. And typically here in the U.S., they come in these large boxes. Now, in the U.S., at least, you'll hear these boxes referred to colloquially as Gaylords. Gaylord is actually was a proprietary name. It was the name of a company that for many years made these large cardboard shipping containers. They had a plastic liner to keep things sealed up. But in the same way that you'll hear people say, oh, give me a Kleenex when they mean facial tissue, you'll hear people in the EPS industry in the U.S. call these gay lords. So the EPS molder will purchase these boxes of uh, beads. And nowadays, the uh, molder will shop for these worldwide, and they're typically bought on price. And I emphasize this because in the years that I've been dealing with EPS as a GFO material, so from, from the early 1990s uh, to the present, I've seen really quite a shift in the market. Uh, for many, many years here in the United States, a EPS molder would only use raw material that was made here in the United States. And there were uh, at least three uh, major resin uh, suppliers here in the United States. Well, this has changed a lot in the last 20 or so years. You find a lot of uh, beads are, are made outside the United States. Uh, and I'm emphasizing this because we can no longer take quality for granted because these are shopped on price. So to the geotechnical end user, they need to take this into consideration. And this is because 
uh, several factors. First of all, beads have a shelf life, as I've said. And yes, you will find, you know, it's it's you know, it's, it's like if you went to a bakery and, and they would have a little rack in the front of the store with uh, day old bread they would sell for half price. Well, resin suppliers do that, too. You know, they have beads that they've made and been sitting in their warehouse and they're getting near their must use by date. They will sell these at a discount here in the United States. They're called OG beads, meaning off grade, meaning that hmm, <laughs> the blowing agent in there is starting to get a little bit on on the borderline of what's usable. Uh, why am I talking about these things? Well, the, these have all come up, believe me. I, I, everything I talk about in this presentation has been an issue on one or more geophone projects I've worked on, either in the U.S. or outside the U.S. I'm not just talking about things in the abstract. These are real-world things that can really uh, have an effect on the quality of the EPS on a project. So... The point is nowadays, in my opinion, the molder really needs to be up front where they get their beads from. And if you're involved in an EPS geophone project that is going to go on for several months or years, uh, you need to, in my opinion, write into the specifications for the project that the if the molder uh, changes the bead source during the course of a project, they've got to tell you about it. Uh, you know, it's, 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 you know, if they start off using a certain manufacturer's beads and then during the course of the project, they buy somebody else's. Yes, it could really affect the quality of the EPS that comes out. Not all beads are created equal. They are not created equal. Again, these beads are a commodity product. And whenever we deal with a commodity product, and we do this all the time, we as civil engineers, I mean, when we buy structural steel, or we deal with structural steel, we deal with Portland cement concrete, we deal with asphalt, these are all commodities. So we've learned that when we deal with a commodity, we've got to do due diligence and testing, not just once, not at the beginning of a project, throughout a project. I mean, if you're involved in a project with Portland cement concrete, what do you do? Well, you take and break cylinders throughout the life of that project. Every truck that comes to that project site, you, you better take a sample of that material. Uh, you can't take it for granted, right? Trust and hope, uh, these are not, these should not be in the lexicon of a design professional. So EPS molding is a two-stage multi-step process and Ideally, it's done over a period of days. You don't do this in minutes. You don't do it in hours. This is a days-long type of process. And, and again, I'm emphasizing this because I've seen, as I mentioned earlier, geophone projects tend to be, I need a lot of material. It's got to be great quality, and I need it yesterday. And most EPS molders are really stressed when they have to do this. Uh, so I, I've seen projects, no projects, where material was shipped out to a job site, literally still warm from the oven. And go to our food analogy, you know, if you were baking a loaf of bread, that bread has got to sit and cool for a while before it can be sliced, right? Well, same thing with EPS. If it comes out of the oven, and we'll see what the oven looks like in a minute. It's got to sit and cool for a while before it could be placed into the ground. And that's not always been done. <clears throat> so regardless of the final EPS product, the first stage of molding is called pre-expansion. This is when the beads are expanded about 50 times in volume. So they go from being what we call beads to what we call pre-puff. So here's our beads. They're put into what is called a pre-expander. And steam is injected in the pre-expander and essentially what this does is the the steam heats up the beads it wakes up the blowing agent that has been dissolved in here basically turns the blowing agent into a gas as we get that volumetric expansion of the gas it's going to cause the polystyrene in the beads to expand <clears throat> 
and that's why it is expanded polystyrene. So we go from beads to pre-puff. This is about a 50 time volume difference by activating the blowing agent in the beads. And this is why if a molder is using beads that have become out of date, OG, off grade, uh, and too much of the blowing agent has evaporated naturally, you're not going to get the volumetric expansion that is required. Now, you could get away with this if you're just making some really cheap cushion packaging to pack around something. You can't get away with this when you're making EPS for geofoam applications. I like the popcorn analogy because it really fits here. Think of the pre-expander as a popcorn popper. And it's the same principle. You know, if you have a popcorn popper, what do you do? Whether you use a microwave or you use an oven heat or a stove heat or whatever, whatever heat source you use when you pop popcorn, what do you do? Well, you vaporize the, the liquid that's in the kernels, right? You turn the liquid water into water vapor and it causes the popcorn to expand. And rather amazingly, uh, when you pop popcorn, you get about the same 50 times volumetric uh, ratio you get when you turn beads into pre-puff. That's, that's just a pure coincidence that the volumetric expansion is roughly about the same, 50 times. And in fact, if you've ever seen a show like uh, How It's Made on TV about how to make popcorn, you'll see that the ways that they do quality control in the popcorn uh, plant is they measure the volume of the beads, uh, of the kernels relative to the popcorn that comes out. Well, let's look under the hood a bit. If we look at this pre-puff, let's enlarge it about 40 times. This is what a, a piece of pre-puff looks like. It's pretty much a perfect sphere. Kind of looks like a small planet or something like that. Uh, has that rough surface. Uh, about This is about a tenth of an inch, two and a half millimeters across to give you some size, uh, size sense. And if we expand, look further, expand it about 300 times or so, we see this is what is inside the piece of pre-puff. We see that we have about now, we went from solid polystyrene here by volume to only about 2% polystyrene by volume here. And this is what the 50 time volume pre-expansion does. It turns the solid polystyrene into something that's only about 2% polystyrene by volume with the rest being voids. Now, when you initially do this pre-expansion, yes, you're going to have some blowing agents still in the cells, but after a couple of days, this is going to be replaced by air. So in the long term, these voids, these cells here, uh, are going to be filled with air when you make EPS. And we see that the polystyrene has been relegated to these very thin walls, kind of like in this honeycomb type of fabric. So this pre-puff, to continue on with manufacturing, this pre-puff is put in these large fabric bags that are typically suspended from the ceilings in the molding plant. And these have to stabilize. They have to cool down. Uh, they have to stabilize chemically. They have to stabilize th uh, thermally. And, and there's a, the point is, is there's time, right? The, all of these things are now well known. How much you do this, how much you do this, you know, in the 70 years or so that the world has been making expanded polystyrene, there are well-defined metrics for how long each step of this process takes. You know, there, there's not a lot of guesswork left in it. Yes, it's going to vary depending on atmospheric pressure. Certainly molders who work in uh, uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, a mile above sea level, uh, almost two uh, kilometers above sea level, going to have to use a little bit different process because of the different atmospheric pressure. Well, it's at this point that we have a divergence of what's the final step to bring things home to make the final EPS product. We go in two different ways. The more common process is what is called block molding, and this is done by a block molder. 
And the Blanc molder takes the stabilized but still fresh. Again, there's a time element here, how long it has to stabilize, hours. Takes a pre-puff, puts it into a seal steel mold, and injects more steam. And this causes some secondary expansion of the pre-puff and a thermal fusion between the pre-puff spheres. So what holds the pre-puff together in the final EPS is not a chemical, it is a thermal fusion. It's not a glue or chemical fusion. Now, at this point of block molding, the block molder can put an optional insect repellent into the mold along with the pre-puff. And this is only done if the EPS is intended for use where there's termites and carpet or ants. Termites and carpet or ants will not eat expanded polystyrene. It is not a nutritive food source for either insect but they sure as heck love to tunnel in it and they love to build nests in it because it's a nice warm cozy place to make home or call home. So this is something that's been done in recent years it may not be done in all countries I know it's done in the US. Well then the block is then released from the mold and this block has to thermally and chemically stabilize as well. Right, because again, it's being heated up in the block molding process and it may be subjected to further processing. Uh, this final stabilization, again, there's a time element here. Uh, a molder can, block molder can speed it up using heat and positive ventilation, but uh, it does say, take some time. And, and I emphasize this because this is one of the main places where I've seen corners cut. I've seen projects where blocks have come out of the mold and literally like a loaf of bread hot from the oven, put on a truck and sent out to a job site. They get out to the job site the next morning and they're still warm to the touch. They should not be warm to the touch, trust me. Well, let's look at this. what this looks like. So we're starting with the pre-puff now in our fabric bags. We put it into a mold. Molds come in very many different sizes. Some are vertical, some are horizontal. But they're basically a big steel box. And here's the block or billet that comes out of that box at the end of the molding process and then put into storage. Now, these are full-size adults. Uh, these are not Smurfs or anything like that. So we see that a couple things, first of all, uh, block sizes can be pretty large. I mean, I've seen EPS blocks uh, used here in the U.S. in recent years that were 8 meters, 25 feet long, as you see here. Um, but there is no standard size in blocks. They come in different sizes in terms of length, width, thickness. And this has changed drastically over time. When I first started getting involved with EPS geofoam uh, in the very early 90s here in the U.S., uh, the blocks were quite small. They were uh, two foot by four foot by eight feet long. Um, you know, only a little bit more than two meters long. And now we're dealing with blocks that are four times that length. So this has changed drastically over the years. But there is no standard block size. Now, a lot of times the block, depending on the final product, will be further processed. And the way that you cut these blocks into various shapes here, they're just cutting it into panels for use as thermal insulation above ground, is EPS block molders use hot wire cutters. You can barely see the hot wires along the side here. Um, these hot wire cutters nowadays are unbelievably sophisticated. They're basically all CNC computer controlled machines. If you've ever seen a CNC milling machine that can mill a piece of metal uh, into a complex shape without a human touching it, well, those are kind of similar to these. I mean, a, uh, these hot wire cutters can take a, uh, a drawing in a certain file format and cut these blocks into shapes, things like that. Uh, let's look at a typical EPS block a little bit more closely. Again, let's look under the hood to see what we have here. 
Uh, if we enlarge this about 18 times, we see what has happened. Here is a typical pre-puff particle after block molding. So this was our pre-puff beforehand, this pretty perfectly spherical little ball of expanded poly of, uh, polystyrene with voids in it. And after it's been molded, you see what happens is because there is some further expansion of the pre-puff, the steam that heat softens the polystyrene and causes a bit more expansion and it causes these pre-puff particles to basically distort to each other. So all of these flattened faces you see here and here and here, these are all the contacts between pieces of pre, this was a piece of pre-puff, this was a piece of pre-puff. So these have all distorted to basically thermally weld it's like a welding process. So it's important to understand that the final manufacture of expanded polystyrene, it's like a welding. It's a thermal fusion. It's the same way as when you weld two pieces of metal together. What do you do? You melt the metal. And when the metal cools, it is thermally fused together. Well, it's the same thing here. You soften. You don't melt the polystyrene, but you soften it. You soften it enough so that it thermally fuses. And this is why I say it, if you have very poor quality EPS, believe me, I've seen some very, very poor quality EPS where you could literally just with your fingers pluck the pieces of pre-puff out of the final EPS because the fusion was so poor. So this bead fusion, as it's called, although it's really pre-puff fusion, it's called bead fusion. This is very important quality step in the final EPS product. So, you know, again, if you see a piece of EPS comes with some packaging, you just bought something and there's pieces of white EPS packing around it and you could pluck out the pre-puff, that's, of course, it's poor quality. That's also why you'll hear people, not so much nowadays, but certainly decades ago, you'll hear EPS called beadboard. And, and I tell you, the EPS industry, at least here in the U.S., doesn't like that. Um, because it harkens back to the days of really poor quality EPS when you could, you know, just pluck out the pieces of pre-puff from the final EPS. They were not thermally fused. But uh, beadboard, you will hear it used still colloquially sometimes. It, it is not a term that should be used in any formal engineering context. But it, it, again, it's important to know that even after this final fusion, and secondary expansion that, again, if we enlarge things about 300 times, that the cellular structure within the piece of pre-puff has been sustained, that we maintain that roughly 98% voids that are filled by air and about 2% solid polystyrene forming the walls of these chambers, if you will, these closed cells. Now generic EPS blocks can be molded in a, a relatively wide range of densities. I'll, I'll talk about some numbers later on. Um, in theory, the final product density affects all material properties, both thermal and what I call the mechanical properties. Mechanical here meaning the stress, strain, time, temperature properties. Although, as I said earlier, density is an imperfect metric for this in practice. There's too many ways to game the system in this final block molding, especially. As I already mentioned, there is no standard EPS block size, and the molder, a lot of molders have different plants. It might produce blocks of different size depending on the plant. Uh, this is very important if you're doing a block layout, say for a lightweight fill, for example. Nowadays, it's considered standard to have the block molder uh, provide the block layout. Uh, you give them some guidelines, they produce the final block layout, because only they know what size they're going to produce the blocks. So some more important terminology, block molded EPS is referred to as EPS block. And thus the most common form of EPS geofoam is properly referred to as EPS block geofoam. Uh, 
So to go back to the very beginning of this presentation, again, nobody wants to have a pair of shoes or a mattress delivered to their job site when they're expecting blocks of expanded polystyrene. We need to use the proper terms. So the proper name for what we're talking about here is EPS block geofoam. That having been said, there are no shortage of papers and all that you'll see in the literature that people talk about geofoam and not give you an idea of what they're talking about. The vast majority of cases, they're talking about EPS block geofoam. There is, for some reason in the U.S., a certain segment of the industry that things, the only geofoam is EPS block geofoam. Well, maybe to them it is, but trust me, to the rest of the world it is not. You got to be, when we're dealing with geofoams, you got to be very specific about, in this case, we're talking about a polymeric geofoam. Which one? Expanded polystyrene in its block form. Why is the block part important? Well, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, EPS block is the geofoam uh, product of choice for all small strain functional applications, lightweight fill, thermal insulation, vibration and noise damping. These projects, especially lightweight fills, generally call for relatively large volumes of EPS block. So generally the block molders should be fairly close to a project site. Uh, at some point, uh, shipping becomes a real cost consideration. Uh, EPS may not be a heavy material, but it's a large volume material. So in the shipping trade, you'll hear people say that the product will cube out as opposed to weigh out. And what it means is that when you have a light product that occupies a large volume, it's going to maximize the cubic capacity of whatever the shipping medium is long before it's going to exceed the weight capacity of the shipping medium. But how close is close enough is quite subjective. And I'll show you an interesting example of that uh, toward the end. Well, the reason we emphasize EPS block and block molding is, is there's another way to make EPS, and this is called custom shape molding or simply shape molding. And this is done by a shape molder. And very often a company that does shape molding is not gonna do block molding and vice versa. Yes, you will find some molders who do both, but as a rule, they're gonna do one or the other. Right? They're simply producing product for different markets. Well, in the case of shape molding, the pre-puff is placed into a special steel mold that has been created to have a unique three-dimensional shape of the final product. And probably the classical product that people have seen, especially here in the U.S., is the ubiquitous white foam coffee cup. All right, everybody in the U.S. calls these styrofoam cups. These are not styrofoam, folks. They're blue, they'd be styrofoam. They're not styrofoam. These are EPS. So the ubiquitous white foam coffee cup in the U.S. Uh, is the classic example of shape molding. In this case, the molds are created in the shape of the final uh, container. And those clamshell containers that are white, those white foam, what they call clamshell containers, those are EPS as well. Now, it's possible, of course, the, and in fact, if you use your imagination, uh, you could make any specific product for the geofoam market. But this has been done in only a very, very few countries. Uh, and I single out the United Kingdom as really being very innovative in this way. Uh, for over 20 years now, in the UK, uh, they've been making an interesting variety of shape molded products specifically for geofoam application. Now, here's a product and its functions are designed to be for thermal insulation of the floor of this warehouse and also for uh, fluid collection and transmission for fluid drainage. Now, in this case, the fluid is not groundwater, but groundborne gases, uh, specifically uh, uh, methane and hydrogen sulfide that can come from uh, naturally from, say, peat bogs or as the result of human activity, say from some former abandoned landfill. So this is being done for gas collection inside the final building, as well as insulation 
thermal insulation of the floor. So this is a this is a one trick pony, as they say. This is a custom shape molded product that is just made for this application. And as I said, uh, one could use your imagination to come up with products, uh, but they're very rare to the point of being non-existent here in the U.S. and most other countries. And it all comes back to what I said earlier about the culture of making EPS. Uh, EPS molders are used to making blocks. They're used to making blocks. They're used to cutting it into thin panels to sell as insulation for above ground construction applications. Uh, they simply have not put the R&D money and time into developing products such as these. There's no reason they couldn't or shouldn't. I would certainly think there'd be a market for products like this here in the U.S. and most other countries. Certainly the, the problems that they have in the U.K. are not unique to the U.K. Uh, enough said on that. Well, before we leave the issue of uh, EPS manufacturing, there are three materials and products that are related to EPS. They're not block molded or shape molded, but they're related to EPS in one way or another. And I'm talking about them because they have very significant geofoam applications. Uh, in fact, two of these three were developed specifically for geotechnical applications. The first one is what we now call resilient EPS block. I like to use the abbreviation R hyphen EPS. Uh, in the older literature, and still some people will use the term elasticized EPS. I, 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 in my older papers, yes, I use the term elasticized too, but I, I like the word resilient better. I think it really describes the function of the material better, or what it does. Uh, but resilient EPS, elasticized EPS are the same thing. And this is a material that is made from low density EPS block. That's pre after the blocks are made and stabilized, they're pre-compressed uh, pre in the molding plant to very large strains. And I'll get into some specifics later when I talk about a specific material and product. And this distorts the uh, shape of the cells in the material. Again, this is what the cells look like within the EPS after block molding. Most of them have this nominally spherical shape. But the elasticization process distorts that to more of an elliptical shape. And that changes the properties drastically in this direction, as we'll see in the following segment. And it's known for a very good reason, as we'll see. And that very good reason uh, was not originally geotechnical, but certainly has a lot of geotechnical applications. Uh, Resilient DPS was developed originally, this is not a new product, uh, as uh, an underlayment in tile or stone floors. In a lot of Mediterranean countries, they do not use carpeting or hardwood in, say, in a, a floor of an apartment or a condo. They tend to use tile or stone. Well, I think you can see if, if you have an apartment building and everybody's got a tile or stone floor on a concrete frame, that's going to make for a lot of noise. So they put a very thin fraction of one inch, a few millimeters thick panel of this resilient EPS under the tile or stone floor. And it, it provides a little bit softer floor as well as one that uh, reduces the sound. Well, it turns out this resilient EPS is also the material of choice for almost all large strain applications such as compressible inclusions, either behind rigid earth retaining structures or above underground conduits. Uh, will people use EPS block for this? Absolutely. And in fact, the majority of papers you see nowadays, they show EPS block. If you like to waste your client's money, use EPS block. If you want to be a good civil engineer and take cost as well as technical considerations into account, you'll use resilient EPS. Uh, this resilient EPS uh, as a geofoam product was once proprietary in the U.S., but it's now generic. The patents have lapsed on this. Any, and I emphasize, any EPS block molder around the world can make resilient EPS. Most of them don't. It's simply because 
no one's asked them. They don't see a market for it. They don't have a market for it. Uh, but trust me, if, if somebody can make EPS blocks, they can make resilient EPS. Uh, the hardware you need to squash, <laughs> for lack of a better technical term, an EPS block after manufacture, uh, that part is not rocket science. I, I, I've seen EPS molders here in the U.S. who used automobile crushers to make resilient EPS. So a block molder can get in the resilient EPS business very quickly, very efficiently, very easily. Well, the second of three materials products I'm going to talk about is what I call glued polystyrene porous block. This was made by taking pre-puff from the first step of EPS production and then chemically gluing the pre-puff together. So you take the pre-puff and you glue it together. The brown you see here is a special bitumen binder. It's put in here as an emulsion, which means the bitumen is suspended in water. The water evaporates, leaves the bitumen behind, and it chemically glues the pre-puff together. And you'll notice here in this cross section, notice how the pre-puff still has its circular or spherical shape. It has not been flattened and distorted as in block molding. So you have a very open fabric. There's a lot of voids in between the glued pre-puff here. Well, it's done intentionally. Uh, this is usually cut in thin panels, put a geotextile on one face, uh, this open texture is done intentionally to provide fluid drainage, primarily groundwater, but also will conduct gases uh, to provide insulated drainage behind rigid earth retaining structures. So this product was developed as a sheet drain. It was originally developed in Europe, I think back in the 1970s. The technology was brought to the U.S. late 70s, early 1980s, that kind of time frame. Uh, so this product has been around a while. This is this is nothing new under the sun. Turns out this material is got pretty good compressibility, so you can use it as a compressible inclusion function as well. Which brings us to our third and final item. Of note: uh, this product is actually a composite of the preceding two. And this is, uh, take a factory laminate, you have a panel of resilient EPS. It can be as thick as you want, four inches, 100 millimeters is typical. And you bond this to a panel of glued polystyrene porous block, two inches, 50 millimeters or so. And you put a brown, you can't see it here because it's brown colored. Put a non-woven geotextile on the face. And you would just glue this to the back of a, say, concrete retaining wall or a concrete basement wall. All right, here would be your wall here. So you would physically glue this to the back. This would come in panels ready to install the job site, typically about, oh, about four foot square, or about 1200 millimeter square. You just attach this to the back of the wall and you provide uh, earth pressure reduction under static loads, you provide a seismic buffer under seismic loads, you provide your groundwater drainage. This is all in one product. There's no generic name for this product for about, it was sold in uh, US and Canada for about 25 years as a Geotech Geoinclusion. Geotech Systems Corporation in Virginia that uh, sold this product has, uh, the owner died, is now defunct. So that's why I say this is, was produced, but uh, certainly it could be easily produced again. The technology has been around for a very long time. As I said, this is a multifunctional product developed specifically for the GFO market. So you, not all GFO specific products have to be shape molded. Uh, you can take things that are related to block molding and make them into geofoam specific products as well. Well, we now move on to material behavior. And as you can see, I've divided this up into quite a few topics. This is probably going to be the longest segment uh, of this presentation. 
uh, intentionally because this is, in my experience, with working with uh, geofoam since the late 1980s and EPS in particular since the early 1990s, this is where design professionals and academicians alike really need to become much, much more knowledgeable. This is where a lot of the bad habits, a lot of the mistakes, a lot of the questionable engineering and questionable research has originated not understanding all of these different material properties. So I'm going to go through this in some detail. OK, let's start uh, with some background material. First of all, all uh, civil engineers are educated and the fundamental mechanics of three basic types of materials that are encountered in engineered construction. They're solids, fluids, and particulates, uh, specifically soil. Uh, I've spent 33 years in academia, full-time or part-time, so certainly become well-versed in undergraduate education uh, in addition to my own. So that's why people take courses in solid mechanics, fluid mechanics, soil mechanics, is because any of the materials we'll encounter in engineered construction are going to typically fall into one of these three categories or perhaps some combinations of the two. I think, however, that there are some significant shortcomings of traditional civil engineering education, at least in the U.S. And again, I, I talk from firsthand experience here. Uh, I've done this for 33 years, uh, up until very recently, so I think I know what I'm talking about. First of all, engineering strains and stresses, which as we know are based on the undeformed geometry of an object, are emphasized. There's very little uh, or no discussion of true strains and stresses, uh, and the accuracy limits of engineering strains and stresses. And if I reflect back on my own undergraduate education 50 years ago, and much more recent undergraduate education, I, I don't see much of a difference between the two, in, in, at least on this topic. And of course, there is a difference. And by the way, throughout this presentation, I will be using the geotechnical sign convention of compression positive. And what this shows is that the solid blue curve are true strains. The dash curve or engineering strains. And there is only a small strain range where the two are basically the same. Whether intensity or compression, there's a divergence. If we look at stresses, the only time true stresses and engineering stresses are the same is if the Poisson ratio of the material is zero. So it does not change cross-sectional dimension in uniaxial tension or uniaxial compression. If the Poisson ratio is positive, as is normally the case, these are the two blue curves you see here. Uh, if it is negative, that corresponds to the dark red curve you see here. Now you might say, well, why are you talking about negative Poisson ratio? Real materials don't do that. Well, yeah, some real materials do. And EPS is one of them. Obviously, that's why I'm talking about it. So bringing up this issue of engineering versus true strains and stresses is not trivial, uh, especially when we are talking about a material like EPS geofoam that can have 20, 30, 40, 50% strains under design conditions. In addition, education, there's relatively little uh, discussion about complex time and temperature dependent material behavior. Things like creep versus relaxation, primary, secondary, tertiary creep, creep rupture. Uh, basically, phenomena that are quite important with most polymeric materials. I mean, strange things such as creep rupture, where a material could look to be stable for a surprising long period of time, then all of a sudden break one day. And I think the, both of these emissions are 
significant given that polymeric materials are used increasingly in engineered construction. And very often the behavior of polymeric materials is really defined by uh, time dependent uh, behavior. We'll go a step further and say that although cellular materials such as EPS are nominally solid materials, they are really quite unique subset of solid materials. Given that they are about, in the case of EPS, about 98% voids and only 2% solids in their final form. Most of our knowledge of solid materials comes from Portland, Portland cement concrete, uh, steel, even when we deal with the wood, which is nominally a cellular material, I mean, if we look at a piece of wood under a microscope, you will see some cellular structure. But certainly not to the point where only 2% of the volume is solid material. So although EPS, as well as the derivative materials, resilient EPS and the glued polystyrene porous block are nominally solids, uh, they have uh, some behaviors that are quite a bit different than traditional solid materials such as structural steel and Portland cement concrete with which civil engineers are infinitely much more familiar. And again, geofoam applications where we get strains well in the double digits, this is beyond the, the typical range of strains we're used to dealing with. You know, when we deal with steel or Portland cement concrete, uh, typically we're dealing with very small strains. And quite honestly, whether we use engineering or true strains doesn't matter. Whether we use engineering or true stresses, well, that might matter a bit more. But certainly not to the same that it does with, uh, say, EPS geofoam and a large strain application. The bottom line is that having worked with geofoam materials for uh, over 30 years now. Um, of anyone who either designs with it or you're conducting research with EPS geofoam or any of these uh, derivative materials, you really need to become very familiar with the mechanical behavior. And uh, not deprecating your education, uh, it's, it's highly unlikely that you learned everything you need to know about these materials. I didn't. I certainly, in the early years uh, that I was dealing with geofoams, I had to spend quite a bit of time to educate myself about some of these unique behaviors of cellular materials. Uh, it does bother me that even though the unique behavior of EPS as a geofoam material is very well established. I mean, it's been in books and conference proceedings and uh, journal papers since at least the mid-1990s. Uh, and, and these are in geotechnical publications. I know because I wrote a lot of this material. I, I'm, I'm disturbed that despite this, there's still a, a persistent chronic lack of understanding of this material behavior. Uh, people think, you know, they write a paper, they do research, they think they know what EPS, how it behaves. They don't. Um, I think in practice, this has resulted in unnecessarily conservative, expensive for your client uh, designs, in some cases, even incorrect designs. And unfortunately, in academic research, I've seen some questionable and downright incorrect conclusions drawn from that research because the researchers did not properly understand the material behavior. Well, I'm not putting anybody down, right? Uh, I certainly was not knowledgeable about EPS when I got out of engineering school. Even when I graduated in 1979 with my PhD, I didn't know anything about EPS. I'm not sure I even heard of EPS. I'd seen it, I didn't, I was probably calling it styrofoam incorrectly like everybody else. Um, but we really as a profession worldwide need to improve our knowledge of, of, of behavior. And, that, and that's really the motivator for me to develop this presentation. Um, is, is 
I, I'm, I'm disturbed by the persistent lack of understanding. I talked about this formally in a paper about a decade ago, and again, uh, I mentioned this paper previously. It was focused on the very specific application of the compressible inclusion function and earth retaining structures uh, using geofoams, but a lot of it had to do with material behavior in general. So let's see what we could do about trying to improve on the knowledge base for both design professionals and academicians alike. Well, let's start off with block molded EPS. Uh, really, the first thing you need to know is about EPS block is its basic characteristics in load displacement and compression. Um, are unique. And you need to understand this to, do, to develop proper manufacturing construction standards. I'm going to talk about standards formally later in this presentation. And also when you write project specific specifications for construction documents. Unfortunately, we can't rely on the long history of EPS. EPS has been around, as I said, for about seven years. We can't rely on that history for providing this necessary technical information. And again, that's because EPS sales, past and present, are geared to non-geofoam applications, which are non-load bearing. So the things that we absolutely need to know about in geotechnical applications, geofoam applications, is not what the industry has been interested in for the last 70 years. And that's really, I think, the heart of it. Usually, as I said, if we look at other geosynthetics, I mean, the companies that make geosynthetics, they're going to write publications about the behavior of their product as a geosynthetic material. Uh, we don't see that for EPS. Uh, and that's simply because you see lots of papers writing about density and thermal insulation but certainly not about load bearing. So in these non-geofoam applications, the stiffness or modulus of the final EPS product is irrelevant, all right? Because again, these, as long as you can handle them, as long as the material doesn't break apart as you ship it and place it at a job site, uh, you don't care about load bearing. You don't, test for it, you don't measure it, you don't write product literature about it. Now, when geofoam applications began to emerge in the 1960s, and this was for insulated road and airfields and railway track systems, uh, and then in the 1970s for lightweight fills, it's kind of interesting. Geotechnical engineers did not immediately recognize the need to design based on material and product stiffness. Uh, if you look at the older literature, uh, specifically from Norway and Japan, Norway in the 70s and 80s, Japan in the 80s and 90s, you see them still fixated. Even though they were designing load-bearing applications, they're fixated on, on product density, which is really irrelevant per se to load-bearing applications. Uh, it was not until the 1990s that really we began to realize that the stiffness uh, properties in compression were the, really the property we need to focus on. And I, I will take credit for this. I this, Certainly this was in my learning process. Uh, you know, I saw how things were done, but it didn't, it didn't make sense to me. You know, I see a load bearing material, yet you're focused on properties that are relevant to load bearing. Uh, but believe me, this was not people didn't come around to this right away. Even though stiffness-based design goes back to the 1990s, certainly been ample geotechnical papers about this. Uh, and my book, Geofilm Geosynthetic, I mentioned earlier, uh, you still pe find people doing things the old way. And I think a large part of that is the EPS industry, at least in the US, has not embraced the needs of the geofoam market. Uh, and, and hopefully, 
you've seen from my discussion of the history of EPS, we see why the EPS industry in general, and certainly here in the U.S., is fixated on density. Everything is about density. That's what they've been conditioned to do for decades. That's what most of their clients are interested in. You know, if they're selling most of their product for use in the walls of buildings or roofs of buildings, that's what the engineers and architects are interested in. What's the R value? What's the R value? They could care less about load bearing. So you can understand why the EPS industry has really not embraced uh, the needs of the GFO market and load bearing. But it is unfortunate, and I, and I think that's one of the major contributors to the fact that there is still to this day a lot of misunderstanding and uh, misuse of EPS and GFOM applications. And as you'll see when we talk about standards, the U.S. EPS industry in general, in particular, still clings to EPS density as the primary material property for all, G even in GFOM applications. They're still selling with this density mindset. And in fairness to design professionals and academicians, I mean, look, I spent the last 30 plus years researching geophones. I, I don't expect the, the vast majority of design professionals and academics to have that experience. You know, it's the same way I go to use, you know, in my engineering practice, if I go to use some other, you know, geotextile or something like that. I, I'm not expert in geotextile, but I expect those who are expert on the subject to publish throughout it. I read what they have to say and I assume, okay, the experts have written this and that. They know what they're talking about. So I realize, you know, I, I've been in engineering practice for almost 50 years now. I realize that as practitioners, we've got to use a lot of different things and technologies we're not individually specifically expert in we rely on other experts to educate us for what we need to know um, it's but it's unfortunate that uh, the I, I do fault the EPS industry for not being more proactive to help educate both design professionals and academics about knowing that load bearing uh, material uh, stiffness is really what's more impo most important, not density. And, I, and, I, and I'll show you why, you know, density is a very imperfect uh, arbiter of uh, load bearing for EPS. Well, I think you get the point. I, I've written about geofoam failures, uh, going back, EPS geofoam failures in particular, going back over 30 years now. Um, and you read these documents, you'll find that the vast majority of these failures were 100% preventable. Uh, it's not a fault of, you know, I said earlier that in a geotechnology, if it's not used properly, it gets a bad, it gets a bad rap, it gets a bad reputation. And, and I've seen this happen at times with EPS geophone. Oh yeah, I heard about it, but I heard about this famous failure. It doesn't work. I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to tell my client to use it. Uh, bad news travels fast. You know, one of the things I've seen with geotechnologies it takes many, many years to develop the confidence in something. All it takes is a couple of high profile failures to destroy that confidence in a short period of time. Well, let's talk about uh, uniaxial compression rapid loading. This is the standard way to the present that block molded EPS has been tested. We've got relatively small specimens, typically two inch 50 millimeter cubes, uh, cut from, uh, prepared from samples that are cut from full size blocks. And, and the reason for this dimension is not accidental. If you do the math, you find that's the, about the biggest cube you can get under a standard 2.8 inch, uh, say, triaxial platen. There's very specific sampling locations from an EPS block. And the reason for these very specific sampling locations is that one of the things I did not talk about earlier is that when you make an EPS block, the density is never uniform within that block. You're gonna have density gradients. 
you know, it, it may be a little bit denser near the edges or the corners, a little bit less dense in the center. You know, again, to use the food analogy, you make a loaf of bread. The final loaf of bread doesn't look homogeneous. I mean, you got the outer crust on the bread, and then you've got the inner part of the bread. They're very different textures. Well, it's the same thing with an EPS block. Uh, you're going to get density gradients. So this sampling pattern has been laid out with a lot of thought in mind to get representative samples from the higher and lower density places in the block. And you can see that this is from uh, the big dig in Boston about 20 years ago. You could see here's, the, there's, they're upside down, but they're labeled ABC, where the uh, testing agency cut samples from the block. And then here you see this is a field lab where the technician is trimming using a special little hot wire apparatus. He's creating two inch cubes for testing. And by the way, I do want to point out when you do this trimming using a hot wire apparatus, you should always have very good ventilation. In fact, you might even want to consider wearing some sort of uh, facial protection. And I'm not talking a mask like we do for uh, COVID-19. I'm talking about uh, a ventilator. Uh, because the hot wire will cause some burning of the EPS as it cuts it. And one of the many products of combustion of EPS that has been treated with a flame retardant is uh, hydrogen bromide gas, which is, uh, let's just say it's not good for your health. So you want to always do this sort of trimming with good ventilation. We then subject these little cubes, uh, whatever their size is. And yes, people have cut cylindrical specimens that look like a tracheal specimen. I've seen people cut 2.8 inch diameter or six inch high, just like you would get uh, from a thin wall tube. And I, I talk about this in the book that I wrote in 1995. Any event, uh, typical, this is your strain rate controlled uniaxial tests, uh, very rapid strain rate. Typically 10% strain is the de facto standard, at least in the US. So a very, very quick test. Uh, this is in the same field lab set up about 10 years ago out in Idaho. Uh, very nice setup. You notice a very small capacity testing machine uh, using a load cell that is the right range for testing small platens. As we know with electronic load cells, the precision of the load cell is a function. It's not absolute. It's relative to the full range of the load cell. Whenever you're using electronic load cell, you want to match the maximum capacity of that load cell to the material or product that you're testing because the precision is going to be a function of that load cell range. This is a good example. This is a terrible example. Uh, this was a testing organization in the United States who will remain nameless on a project that will remain nameless, but it was a very high profile EPS block geofoam project here in the US not all that long ago. Unfortunately, this testing agency, and, and I don't fault the testing agency. I fault the engineers involved who did not tell the testing agency how to properly run the tests. You know, again, testing agencies who normally do civil, test civil engineering materials, they're used to breaking concrete cylinders, to testing steel specimens. They're not used to testing two-inch cubes of EPS. You have to educate them, as was done in this case. The testing firm did a great job in this case. We told them what was needed, explained to them why it was needed. They did a great job in complying. Here, the testing lab thought they used the same setup. They were breaking cylinders. Break a, a concrete cylinder this morning, we'll test an EPS cube this afternoon. Way too big platens, a load cell that way too high capacity. And then they wondered why the test results were erratic all over the place. No, no. Okay. Got to pay attention to these details.
So the most significant behavioral characteristic of EPS block and unioxidal compression is that it does not fail in the traditional material rupture sense of true solids. You know, whether you have wood or Portland cement concrete or structural steel, if we load it in compression, it's going to physically rupture at some point. In the case of EPS, it simply crushes back to solid polystyrene. You simply squeeze the air out of the cellular structure. You destroy the cells, the voids are eliminated. Well, this results in some unusual, at least for true solid behavior, uh, at very large strains, you can actually get a uh, necking, which produces a negative Poisson ratio. I mean, it seems kind of counterintuitive. You're running a compression test, and yet the specimen is get smaller in cross-sectional area and thus have a negative Poisson ratio. Well, that will happen large strains when you're testing block molded EPS. Uh, the Poisson ratio of EPS is slightly positive, close to zero with small strains. A lot of times for design purposes, we assume it's zero. Well, here's a typical large range, large strain range, going up to 90%. Again, these are uh, engineering strains and stresses using a geotechnical sign convention. Uh, here's the density unit weight of the test specimen. Very, very typical for EPS used for geofoam applications. Uh, and you see very classical behavior. Uh, very small, nominally linear elastic range, yielding, and then post-yielding work hardening. Uh, no physical rupture. You're just squeezing this back to solid polystyrene. And again, if we, we look at true versus engineering strains, we see really, you know, with these are engineering strains, we start getting up into here, we see that the true strains are really more like two, three hundred percent, not 60, 70, 80 percent. So again, all that's happening in this range is we're just squeezing the air out of these cells. That's why we don't get a physical rupture like we do with other solid materials. So EPS block has no strength in a traditional sense in uniacetal compression, but that has not stopped the industry from just finding compressive strength. So you look at any EPS block standard, you will see something called compressive strength. Uh, it's an arbitrary number. It's, it's very fictitious, it's completely arbitrary, has no physical meaning other than number one, it corresponds to an arbitrary strain level. Here in the US, usually 10%, I've seen some countries, such as Norway, use 5%, but 10%, I would say, is a typical number. And it's a strain level after a sharp reduction in material stiffness in the routine rapid loading test. So going back to here, here's the same test I showed you a minute ago. This is the quote-unquote compressive strength. The stress, compressive stress, at 10% strain, strain defined in an engineering sense. So notice though, this is not compressive strength in the traditional way we would think of it for either steel or concrete or wood or something like that. The stress at which the material physically ruptures. Uh, looking a little bit different specimen, a little bit higher density unit weight uh, under a smaller strain range, again, is the compressive stress at 10% strain. So here the quote-unquote compressive strength would be about 235 kilopascals. So what, about uh, four and a half uh, kips per square foot, something like that. And by the way, in the EPS industry, when you see these quote-unquote compressive strengths, in the US, they are typically quoted in uh, PSI, pounds per square inch. So more structural engineering units than what we're used to as geotechnical engineers. So because strength and compression is irrelevant for EPS, uh, block mold EPS, that means um, we really need to use uh, displacements and stiffness for quantifying the material behavior.
And we find it useful to define what we call the elastic limit stress. And this is typically the stress at an arbitrary compressive strain, usually 1%. And we also use an initial single value secant Young's modulus because the EPS is very close to being linear elastic up to this 1% strain. So again, going back to the same test curve I showed you a couple times now, uh, this would be the nominally linear elastic range. The elastic limit stress would be down here. So we see that, again, we're going to see in small strain applications, this is really the region of interest in, say, lightweight fills or thermal insulation beneath pavements or things like that. Really, really just this initial part of the overall stress strain curve. But it is important to understand the overall behavior. You need to know what we're dealing with. And again, this is a little bit denser material under a smaller strange range I've shown you. Here's the compressive strength, quote unquote. This is really the, the range we're interested in. So at 1% strain, we'd come over and we would say, this is the elastic limit stress. So for this particular material, about 30 kilograms cubic meter, roughly two pounds per cubic foot, um, we would say this would be the elastic limit stress. And, and we'll see why this 1% strain is kind of a magic number. It's, it's not just based on this, these results in a rapid loading test. It just is the rapid loading test is a convenient way to determine the elastic limit stress. You know, again, we're still here. Note that we're still using the same rapid loading test that the EPS industry has been using for over 50 years now. We're not, we're not making the industry do something drastically different. But we're simply using the same test they've used for a long time to focus on, quote unquote, compressive strength. We're using the same test results to focus on something that is of much more explicit significance for geofoam applications. So to sum things up, the operative compressive stiffness of EPS block depends entirely on the integrity of this cellular structure. And this is the characteristic of what we call small strain geofoam applica uh, applications such as lightweight fills, uh, insulated pavements, noise and vibration damping, small strain uh, vibration damping. We want to maintain the integrity of the structure. This is when the material is at its stiffest. Because once the cellular structure has been deformed for any reason, and that includes physical damage and handling, you drop it, you dent it, you poke holes in it, you're going to change the material behavior permanently, and you can't restore it. You can't repair it. You can't say, oh, just, you know, I, I made this hole in it. Let me patch it up. You, you, can't, you can't fix it. There is no way, once you've damaged EPS, there is no way you can physically repair it, restore it to its original condition or anything close to it. So EPS stiffness is very dependent on the stress state and the stress history. And because it's polymeric material, of course, time and temperature are important as well. Well, rapid loading is how the EPS industry around the world historically passed into the present test EPS uh, for any application uh, primarily directed at the above ground thermal insulation market. As we've seen, we can adapt their standard test to some useful geofoam useful information. Again, we're not asking the industry to change what they've done. Uh, we're just using what they've done in a more intelligent fashion. All right, they focused on things such as compressive strength, which is irrelevant. It's just an arbitrary number. Something to put in a sales brochure has no meaning for uh, rigid cellular polystyrene. But we're using that same test to measure the elastic limit stress and uh, the initial secant Young's modulus
things that are explicitly of use to us in GFOM applications. But rapid loading uh, doesn't answer all our questions because as we know, GFOM applications being load bearing, most of those loads are sustained in some way. So the rapid loading test, if we look at look at the test curve generically, is really misleading for GFOM applications. Yes, it does provide some useful information, but not all the information we need to know. And that's because our load bearing applica applications always involve loads of some duration and certainly permanent in the case of dead loads. So we need some additional tests to provide some insight under the sustained loading. And a remedy to this, we need a three phase approach. First, we have to perform unconfined compressive creep tests uh, of appropriate duration. And, and appropriate duration is 10,000 hours minimum. 10,000 hours, do the math, it's about 13 months, a little bit more than a calendar year. Uh, longer or better. Uh, We'd like to see 15,000, even 20,000 hour tests. So we're talking about creep tests that run at least a year, preferably two plus years. And these tests, they've been done on two inch cubes. Uh, I certainly have had creep tests done on cylindrical specimens that are basically the same as an odometer test that we would perform, a consolidation test in a geotechnical laboratory. Uh, specimens that are 2.8 inches in diameter, one inch high. Uh, why? It allows us to use uh, traditional geotechnical odometer apparatus for this. Uh, we then take this 10,000, 15, 20,000 hour test data and we extrapolate it using some mathematical model such as the Finley equation or there's many uh, equations that derive from this. About 20 years or so ago, I wrote a research report on modeling the stress strain time behavior of uh, geosynthetics with a focus on EPS block geofoam. And you can provide, find some additional information on these different mathematical models there. And then we create families what we call isochronous stress strain curves for use in design. And if you're not familiar with this type of curve, uh, here's a test on a specimen. You can see the density and unit weight here. Very typical density product that we would use in a geofoam application. Uh, relatively small strain range, only up to about 5% strain. Here's an excerpt or a portion of the rapid loading test. And these are what we call isochronous stress strain curves. Essentially what this says, let's take the 10,000 hour curve here. And I've, I've left the zeros out here, which are common, the, zero, the commas I mean. Uh, as we know, uh, certainly in many countries, a comma means a decimal place. So in the United States, we typically would put one zero comma zero 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 to mean 10,000. But in a lot of countries, you would see that and say, oh, 10, with three decimal places to zero. So I didn't want to create any confusion. So what this curve means is, all right, if this is the rapid loading curve, we load at 10% strain per minute. This would be the stress strain curve if we sustain the load for 10,000 hours or a little bit more than a year. And the way that you generate these, so know that in other words, see there are in decrements of time, one hour, 10 hours, 100, 1,000, 10,000. The way you generate these so-called isochronous stress strain curves is you perform creep tests at different stress levels. So we do tests in this case at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 kilopascals. Uh, notice on this specimen, this is the elastic limit stress here, the stress at 1% strain in the rapid loading test. So the elastic limit stress is about 53 kilopascals, so a little bit more than 1,000 kips per square foot in imperial units. So we run creep tests at different stresses, sustained stresses. We would measure the strains at 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 hours. 
So you create data points and then just simply fit smooth curves through those data points. Again, that's the elastic limit stress, as I pointed out. If we look at these same results, but in a somewhat larger strain range, you see all the isochronous stress strain curves are way down here. And I've done this specifically because for this material. And again, here's the elastic limit stress here. Here's the so-called compressive strength here. Right? If you were look at look at EPS molders, manufacturing literature, they say, oh, comp compressive strength of this product is about 165 kPa. All right, about three and a half kips per square foot. That's meaningless in a geofoam application. That's just an arbitrary number in a very rapid loading test. Because look, under sustained loads, like we get in geofoam applications, all the action is down here. All the action is down here. All right, because notice how Ten, this is the 10,000 hour curve, a little bit more than a year. Look at how these strains under the sustained loading are taking off. Right? Uh, compressive strength tells us absolutely nothing. It's irrelevant. The elastic limit stress, though, is much more insightful. So the point I'm getting at here, and, and what's been missing from a lot of things is uh, that the time-dependent behavior of EPS block, especially creep, is really essential for both small and large strain geofoam applications. Because a lot of these, whether you're looking at a lightweight fill under a road pavement or railway track system, uh, or if you're looking at it behind a retaining wall, it's really the loads are going to be sustained. So it's the creep behavior that's going to govern your design. Uh, notice that these plastic strains, these time-dependent strains that occur with a polymeric material like EPS block, uh, they are a detriment or negative for small strain functional applications. You don't want to have excessive creep strains under a lightweight fill, just like if you were building a, a, an earthwork over Clays, you don't want to have long-term excessive creep strains. Uh, but certainly, these creep strains are actually beneficial for large strain functional applications such as compressible inclusion. So we see that part of the reason why in the last several decades we've come to really focus on this elastic limit stress and this magical 1% strain number is that, it, first of all, it's easy to measure in the standard rapid loading test. But also, we found for small strain applications, such as lightweight fills, if we keep the stresses, the long-term stresses, below the elastic limit stress, we tend to find that the creep strains are not that bad. I mean, you might get another half a percent strain after a year or so. So this is part of the reason why elastic limit stress has really become the centerpiece of designing with EPS block geofoam, at least in uh, small strain applications. Let's talk about repetitive loading. Again, this is something that does not come up historically. But in most EPS block geofoam applications, you have some type of repetitive loading. Again, a lightweight fill for an earthwork, uh, you're going to have traffic loading. You might have seismic loading. And neither rapid loading tests or conventional creep tests are very good at giving you insight into this. Unfortunately, there is no single test for repetitive loading because repetitive loads tend to be unique to a given application. Depends on the stress and strain history, as well as the magnitude and frequency of the cycles, the number of cycles, things like that. You know, are we talking about a million traffic cycles and a relatively small stress? Are we talking about 10 cycles from an earthquake? 
you're going to get very different behavior. So consequently, cyclic load testing is something that in a lot of cases really needs to be done on a project-specific basis. I want to talk about something now we call regrind. Uh, and as I've mentioned previously, EPS block can be routinely, and I emphasize routinely molded within a certain range of densities. Here in the United States, that range is about three quarters of a pound a cubic foot to three pounds. Now, can you make less dense material? Yes, you're really careful. You could. Can you go greater than this? Yes. This is really a, a reasonable range. All right, you could always find exceptions to this, but for discussion purposes, this is a reasonable range in EPS densities and block molding, routine block molding. Now, in a perfect world, the various properties I've talked about, like elastic limit stress, etc., compressive strength, initial secant Young's modulus, will vary with material density, actually in a more or less linear manner. And, and I found this when I did the research for my 1995 book, Geofoam Geosynthetic. But I say perfect world. We don't live in a perfect world. Because we don't live in a perfect world, density alone should never be used as an indicator or metric for EPS quality. We should never use it as an indicator of elastic limit stress, initial secant Young's modulus, anything like that. The reason is there's too many variables when you mold EPS. I mean, we talked about some of them. I mean, how old are the beads that you use? Uh, you know, were, were the, was the pre-puff seasoned in those big fabric bags hanging from the ceiling? Was it seasoned properly? Uh, how long did you season the block after it came out of the mold? All of these things, all of these myriad details are going to affect the things such as the secant modulus or the elastic limit stress, uh, although they may not affect the density very much. But really at the top of the list is something called regrind. Regrind is the term used, at least here in the United States, for recycled implant scrap. And I, and I, I want to mention that Although recycling of plastics has been very big for a long time now, uh, certainly in some countries more than others, we will, people always talk about, you know, can I, can I make a product out of recycled uh, plastics? Uh, this really does not work very well for EPS. Uh, there is, and this is why most places will not take what we call post-consumer uh, EPS as a recycled material because you have material. I mean, where did the material come from? If it's a coffee cup, it doesn't have any flame retardant in it. If it was uh, a piece of insulation from a building, it's going to have flame retardant in it. So it may have a pesticide in it. So there, there are simply too many variables of, of things that uh, post-consumer recycled EPS is, is, is not used. But in the molding plant, where the molder knows where the recycled material comes from, all the scrap that comes from trimming EPS blocks, things like that, uh, gets recycled. And it's called regrind. And what they do is they simply take the scrap, they put it in special machines that were made for this, and they grind it up into like a dust or a powder. Uh, in my opinion, it's, it's one of the most important and contentious issues of manufacturing or molding EPS. It's what I call the elephant in the room. It's always there, but believe me, the EPS industry does not like to, they don't like people to know about it outside the industry, and they certainly like, don't like to discuss it. It's, it's kind of a trade secret, if you will. And the reason is the effect of regrind. Right, if we, this is virgin pre-puff, this is what virgin pre-puff looks like when it has been properly molded. And this is the cell structure of the virgin pre-puff. Right, we've seen all these things before. Well, regrind is basically inert particles of ground molding scrap that are placed in the mold during the final molding. 
So where the regrind is introduced is when the molder, block molder, takes virgin pre-puff, puts it in a mold, going to put in some regrind as well. And the percent of regrind can vary at the molder's discretion. There are no standards for this, but it can be significant. Uh, I've seen in online discussions people saying that some molders will use anywhere from 10% to as much as 40%, which is a huge number of regrind. In talking with people in the industry, they may grudgingly admit they put 5 to 10% regrind in there. But whatever the percentage is, it's not trivial. Well, the reason I'm bringing this up is that the regrind is nothing but cheap filler. It's there for one purpose alone. The block molder has generated this scrap. What are they going to do with it? Pay somebody to haul it away? Um, so it's basically used as a cheap filler. But I, I liken it to when you make Portland cement concrete. What do we do? We take Portland cement, we take coarse and fine aggregate, and we take water. Well, if you think about it, what does the aggregate do? The aggregate is cheap filler. I mean, the coarse and fine aggregate is cheaper than Portland cement. So the whole logic of Portland cement concrete is to balance how much aggregate, how much water, how much cement to optimize the product. But if all you wanted to do was to make cheap Portland cement concrete, well, you'd put a lot more aggregate in there. You'd put other stuff in there. It's like around the New York area, people used to make what was called cinder concrete, where they would take the cinders from burning anthracite coal for heating purposes, and they would use the cinder as a cheap aggregate. I mean, it made garbage concrete. It made concrete that F prime C's of like, you know, 800 PSI. I mean, when you think that normal concrete in foundations, three, 4,000 PSI and higher. And here you're talking about concrete in hundreds of PSI. So regrind is just a cheap filler. And again, for a lot of the, the, the non-critical products that EPA, you know, if an EPS molder is making something that's going to be cut up and used to package a consumer appliance that's being shipped, well, you know, they can get away with it. Well, it's going to make a big difference if you're going to place this under a roadway. So regrind has evolved over decades as a cost-saving measure. Again, it's a cheap filler. And it was really a concern in the pre-geofoam era because, as it turns out, the thermal properties, again, if you're going to use EPS block as above-ground thermal insulation, no load-bearing, the thermal properties of EPS and the arbitrary compressive strength are really little affected by regrind. You know, assuming you don't go crazy with it, but you know, you use five, ten percent regrind numbers like that, you could produce a product that was probably okay for thermal insulation in, in a wall or a roof. The reason I'm emphasizing regrind. Because believe me, an EPS molder is not going to jump out and tell you about it. Uh, is because I've done independent research in the past to show that regrind has a tremendous impact on the things that are important in geofoam applications: the stiffness, the elastic limit stress, the Young's modulus. Uh, th these curves, although they are qualitative, they're based on quantitative testing I've done myself in a research laboratory back in the 1990s. And this simply shows that if you take material that has been, in this case, I had an EPS molder who shall remain nameless in the US, who had on a, a basically a little research project basis, the molder made EPS of more or less the same density with varying parts uh, percentages of regrind starting with none. So basically testing specimens that had pretty much the same density but different in how much regrind it was very interesting the curves would tend to flatten the more regrind that was used the softer this curve became what was all interesting is these curves all tended to come together 
at about 10% strain, which is about what the compressive, this artificial compressive stress is, strength is. But the elastic limit stresses, which are the stresses at 1% strain, are very, very different. You'll see sometimes people use, even to the present, rules of thumb. Well, the elastic limit stress is a certain percentage of compressive strength, you know, 0.33 of the compressive strength, 0 0.35, 0 0.4, numbers like that. Should never use these for EPS block geofoam design. The reason is, in this case, you got one compressive strength, but you got a whole range of elastic limit stresses. There's no one single ratio of elastic limit stress to compressive strength, even though all these specimens had pretty much the same density. So these empirical correlations you'll sometimes see are unreliable and are never a substitute for doing product-specific laboratory testing. You need to run the stress-strain curves. You need to determine the elastic limit stress. You need to determine the initial secant Young's modulus. Again, I, I circle back to this. EPS block geofoam is rocket science for the EPS industry. A lot of the things that the industry has done for decades, such as regrind and using OG beads and things like that, they're fine if you're making a low or medium quality product for a very undemanding non-load bearing application. That's why you could see, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised you might get some consumer product that's packed in a piece of EPS and you could sit there and pick the beads out of the EPS. I know I've done that all the time. Well, that's not a very demanding application. So they're basically generating a very low quality, low cost product for a low demand application. But when we're designing earthworks that are gonna supporting roadways or airfield pavements or railway track systems, buildings in some cases, bridges in some cases, then it is rocket science. We've got to pay attention to detail, especially and specifically the material stiffness. Well, just to wrap up this material behavior, let's talk a little bit about EPS shape and also the derivative materials. Uh, the, the shape molding process results in a final product that cannot be generalized as we can with block molding. And that's because when you have a shape mold, it's going to create a finished product that has distortions and stress concentrations at the corners and the edges, things like that. Um, so you can't develop any general comments about behavior. So if you were to have a shape molded EPS product, such as I showed you that one product in the UK for insulated drainage, um, you really need to measure the load bearing characteristics of that product uniquely. So whoever's pr producing this shape molded geofoam product needs to provide you with the information you need under short term loading, sustained loading, creep loading, um, cyclic loading, whatever you feel is appropriate for your project. Talk about the derivative materials a bit. Uh, resilient EPS and glued polystyrene porous block. These uh, require separate discussion because they have behaviors that are very different than normal EPS block. Uh, the stress-strain curves in both rapid and sustained loading, and therefore the material stiffnesses are very different as well. But the one common element is, is both resilient EPS and the glued polystyrene block. As with normal EPS block, they will never fail in traditional uniaxial compression. They just crush back to uh, the solid polystyrene. So they, they do have this in common with EPS block. Well, let's first talk about resilient EPS. Uh, I want to elaborate a bit more on this elasticization process so we, we, we understand why we're seeing the test results I'm going to show you. So to create resilient EPS, 
uh, after the EPS block has seasoned, we subject it to an additional step called elasticization. It's normally performed on an entire EPS block, but certainly nowadays, if you have some of these big blocks that can be 8 meters, 25 feet long, more than likely you're going to want to cut that into smaller pieces just to fit into whatever piece of machinery you're going to use to perform the elasticization. As I said, there is no standardization on this machinery, at least at the present time. So the idea is you take this EPS block or a portion of a block and you compress it in one direction to about a third of its original dimension. So let's say this is an exploded view here. This is about 300 times magnification. This is the cell within the EPS block. We're going to focus on this one cell. And now we're going to compress it relatively rapidly to about one third of its original thickness. And then when we take the load away, we'll find that actually the block will rebound substantially. Uh, I've done lots of testing in the laboratory where I have, and again, this is discussed in my 1995 book. You know, I, I elasticized to 10%, 20, 30, 40, 50. Uh, strains up to about 80 or 90% strain. And, and I found that about two-thirds, about 65, 70% compression is a good number for elasticization. And when you do that, actually, we'll, it'll recover about 90% of its original thickness. So if you had a block that was, say, three feet thick, you compress it down to about a foot thick, it'll rebound to about 2.7 feet thick when you remove that load. But again, the elasticization permanently leaves these ellipsoids with the short axis of the ellipsis, uh, ellipse in the direction of the elasticization loading. Well, once you've elasticized the EPS block, you then cut it into panels or pieces uh, for the final product using the hot wire apparatus. Well, the, the significant permanent effects on the mechanical properties are that you're going to get a lower, much lower initial secant Young's modulus, in the, but only in the direction of elasticization. A uh, much extended strain range for the nominal linear elastic behavior. Instead of 1%, it's going to be, you know, more like, you know, 40%, something like that. And the benefits are really most useful for compressible inclusion applications where resilient EPS is now the material of choice. That is, unless you like to spend your client's money and just use normal EPS block. That's up to you. And that's because a relatively thin panel of resilient EPS will have the same magnitude of displacement. Right? Because, again, if you're designing a compressible inclusion, whether it's behind a rigid retaining wall under gravity or seismic loading, or above an underground conduit, you're looking for a certain amount of displacement to reduce the lateral earth pressure from, say, the at-rest state to the active state, or to create an arch over the underground conduit. So it's a displacement-based design. So you look, you have a target amount of displacement you're looking for. Now, whether you achieve that displacement with a relatively thin piece of resilient EPS, or a much, much thicker amount of block molded EPS, that's up to you, the design professional. But the cost difference is absolutely enormous between the two choices. Because again, we're talking about a volumetric issue, and that's, that's how EPS is sold. And I will tell you, the, the, the process of elasticization, it's, it's trivial compared to the cost of making the EPS. Because all you're doing is, is just taking a piece of EPS block or an entire EPS block and then very quickly compressing it and releasing it. It's not, it doesn't, doesn't take hours or days to do this. It takes minutes. The elasticization process is something that could be done in minutes. So it does not or should not add very much to the final product. 
but it can add tremendously to the performance of the final product in large strain applications. It's very important to understand that there is no single resilient EPS for the same reason EPS block is not a single material. And this is because you, in principle or concept, you can perform this elasticization process on EPS block of any density. So it's not a single density. You could take any EPS density and you could elasticize it. But the properties of the elasticized or resilient EPS will always be relative to the properties of the original EPS block. So for pragmatic reasons, in practice, we've only elasticized very low density EPS, about the lowest that can be reasonably made. In the US, historically, this is material with a density of 3 quarters of a pound per cubic foot, about 12 kilograms per cubic meter. This is the lowest density EPS that can be produced routinely, reliably, consistently in the, EP in the US. Now, could you get this down to 0 0.7, 0 0.65? Yes, but it, to, to get that a little bit lower density in general is not going to be worth it. The point I'm trying to make here is that Historically, it's only made sense to elasticize whether we're doing it for a geofoam product or we're doing it to put under a tile floor in Spain or Italy. It only makes sense to elasticize very low density EPS, not a higher density EPS. Also, as I said, the elasticization process is not standardized. I mean, the equipment you use, how quickly you load it, unload it. Uh, this has not been standardized to date, although it certainly could be. There's nothing to prevent that from being standardized. So unless and until we standardize resilient EPS, uh, we really should treat it as a proprietary product. Proprietary in the sense that it's going to depend on the molder who makes it, what density product they use initially, how they compress the product, things like that. I'm going to give you some typical numbers for a product that was called Geotech TerraFlex. And this was a resilient EPS product that was made in the U.S. and marketed in the U.S. for about 25 years by the now defunct Geotech Systems Corporation. It was also uh, sold in Canada. So this was, for 25 years, it was a real product that was sold commercially. And again, it was made out of typical three quarter pound, 12 kilogram material. So this would be the normal stress strain curve. And this would be, uh, again, this is in standard uniaxial rapid loading. This would be the resilient material. And we see very dramatically in the rapid loading test, the difference in behavior. Of course, as you get to the higher strains, it's all being crushed back to solid, poly, uh, solid polystyrene. So these tur curves are tending to uh, overlap. Well, let's look at the uh, isochronous uh, curves. This is more important to us in geofoam. Again, this is 10,000 hours, not 10 hours. Right? That's a comma not intended to be interpreted as a decimal. So this is the normal EPS. This is the isochronous stress strain curves. And by the way, all of these curves were generated uh, by an independent third party laboratory. So this was not generated by Geotech Systems, was not generated by me. Uh, these were done by certified geotechnical laboratories in the United States. So these are high quality, high confidence uh, test results. Well, if we look at resilient EPS that was made from the original same source, 12 kilogram, three quarter pound material, uh, there's the rapid loading and here's the isochronous stress strain curves. What's really insightful is if we overlay things, here's the normal EPS with the resilient EPS overlaid. And here's where we really see the difference, right? Look under these lower stress levels that are really, these are the stress levels we're talking about in typical geotechnical applications, whether it's behind an earth retaining structure or above an underground conduit, these are the stress ranges we're normally, that we're normally working in. And notice that whether we're talking about rapid loading, which are the heavier curves, or the 
long-term sustained loading, which are the lighter, the thinner curves, that the Brazilian EPS is a much more compressible product. I mean, for example, here with the Brazilian EPS, we get 30% strain, whereas with the normal EPS, we're only getting 10%. So that means to get the same amount of displacement, you'd have to use three times the thickness of the normal block molded EPS. And this is why I said early on, there is no one material or product, EPS GFO material product, to use for all GFO applications. And in particular, EPS block is not a one-size-fits-all product for all geofoam applications. I mean, it really breaks my heart for the, the, the client's money that was wasted when I see uh, people talking about using normal block-molded EPS uh, to induce arching over an underground conduit, and they're talking about significant thicknesses of block-molded EPS because they're basing the design on short-term rapid stiffnesses of EPS, whereas in reality they should be using resilient EPS. And again, I'm not promoting a, a proprietary material here. Any EPS molder around the world can make a resilient EPS. The only part that's proprietary is that no two molders will do it the same way. They may use a different machine for it, the protocol for loading and unloading may be different. So that's the only proprietary part. But any block, EPS block molder anywhere in the world could make resilient EPS today if they wanted. And, and again, we're really, uh, the, thing, the point I'm getting at here is simply the cost. Uh, you might only need a few inches of resilient EPS, a few tens of millimeters of resilient EPS to induce arching above a, a conduit rather than using several feet or a couple meters of EPS block. And, and the cost implications for your client are, are enormous because on a unit volume basis, the cost of resilient EPS is not or at least should not be terribly gr much greater than the block molded EPS, because most of that money is going is based on the price of a barrel of oil, not elasticizing that EPS. And again, this is now the third time I've shown you this paper. I, I discuss all these things in more detail in this paper from 2010. Uh, summarize key behavior in uniaxial compression for resilient EPS. Rapid loading, we see a big difference in the stress range of interest in geotechnical applications. Uh, we certainly see the sustained loading behavior and cyclic loading. Again, this uh, seismic buffer, as it's now nowadays called, when we use EPS geofoam as a compressible inclusion under seismic loading. Uh, there have been cyclic loading tests. Again, these were done by a reputable certified third-party laboratory, run out to 600 cycles at different stress levels. All right? This just shows that, you know, depending on the initial stress, 15, 30, 45, 75 kilopascals, here's the imperial units equivalents here. Uh, these are the initial stresses applied rapidly. We get strain. But what this is saying is that, for example, under 30 kilopascals, about 600 K of PSF, we initially get about 10% strain. But then as we cycle plus or minus 10 kilopascals around that 30, so we're going up to 40, down to 20, up to 40, repeating those 600 times. I forget what the cyclic rate was in these tests. Uh, it's been over 20 years since I looked at the results, to be honest. Uh, we see that there's not a, a, a lot of additional plastic strain that accumulates. And notice how these stabilize, right? They settle down. This is very similar to if you're doing a pavement design, what's called resilient modulus, for example, of an unbound gra uh, aggregate layer, where you may run a cyclic triaxial test to whatever, you know, 100,000 load cycles or something like that to see under traffic loads how that material is going to pack down. 
Well, that's what we're doing the same thing here. And what we're saying with Rosane EPS, it really does not, yes, you will get some additional plastic strains under these hundreds of load cycles, uh, but they are not uh, overwhelming. They're not going to crush the material. Finally, talk about glued polystyrene porous block, which is, again, we take the uh, pre-puff and we special, place in a special steel mold with a bitumen-based emulsion that chemically bonds the pre-puff together into this open fabric. And to use our food analogy one more time, this always reminded me of Cracker Jack, a food product here in the United States some of you may be familiar with, where they take popcorn to make Cracker Jack. It's a snack product. They just take popcorn and they glue it together, if you will, with kind of a sugary caramel tasting uh, uh, material that hardens and glues the popcorn together. Uh, except with uh, glued polystyrene porous block, you don't get a toy inside, unfortunately. With Cracker Jack, you always got a nice little toy inside. Uh, you don't get that with glued polystyrene porous block. You just get a, a very interesting geofoam product. Uh, and then they cut it into panels. Uh, again, this is a non-standard material in, in that it depends on the molder who makes it. Uh, this was another Geotech product for about 40 years. It uh, was sold as Geotech drainage board without a Geotech style on one face. Geotech drainage panel with a Geotech style. It was basically sold as a sheet drain to provide self-insulating uh, fluid drainage, mostly groundwater. Uh, and they're sold as panels that were four feet, about 1,200 millimeters square, typically two inches thick, although they could make whatever thickness you wanted. By just pure coincidence, the drainage border panel had the same behavior as the uh, aforema uh, aforementioned uh, Terraflex Resilient EPS. Uh, so this drainage panel was also a good compressible inclusion. And that's what led to the Geotech Geo inclusion I mentioned previously. So this is Resilient EPS factory laminated to the polystyrene porous block with a, you can't see it here, of course it's brown, geotextile on one face. And, and this would just, so the, this entire product was only about six inches, 150 millimeters thick. And you could place this behind a rigid retaining wall or basement wall of a building. And it would reduce the lateral earth pressures from the active state to the at rest state would act as a seismic buffer and would provide uh, groundwater drainage around the building as well. So a very, very cost-effective, efficient product. I think at one time years ago, this was selling for like a dollar a square foot or something like that. Uh, don't quote me on 2020 prices. These are very old prices. But it was a very cost-effective product, uh, for, certainly for what you got out of it. Considering that you could design this basement wall for the active earth pressure state instead of the at rest state, uh, it was a bargain for what it cost you to put in to induce the active earth pressure state, a tremendous cost saving in the reinforced concrete in the wall. Well, that brings us to the final segment, but by certainly by no means least important segment, and that involves standards. And I've divided this up into uh, several topics as well. Well, let's start off with an overview. Anyone who's been involved in engineering construction knows that standards are really one of the cornerstones. Uh, they're authoritative references that everyone agrees on. And uh, they're used as the basis for preparing project-specific uh, construction specifications, which uh, are an important part of the contract documents. Uh, standards can cover different aspects. Uh, we cover the basic materials. They might cover a product made from one or more materials, uh, shipping, handling, placement of products, 
uh, as well as sampling and testing of either materials or products that is related to either material quality control and assurance as well as construction quality control and assurance. And just so you're all agreed on terminology here, or at least the way I'm using terminology, quality control, whether it relates to a material and product or it relates to the construction activity, is something that is done by the organization in control of that material activity. So quality control is something, for example, that an EPS block molder would do in their own molding plant uh, to check on quality. And, and block molders do, do this. Uh, I didn't show you any slides, uh, but in the research report that I referenced at the beginning, uh, early in this presentation, I show you some typical slides uh, or photos of block molders who have a little lab set up in their premises to check on pre-puff density and things like that, flammability tests. Uh, construction quality control is something that a construction contractor would do within their organization to control the quality. Whereas quality assurance, whether of a material or product or construction activity, is something that is done by an independent third party representative of the owner. You know, on a project, you have some project owner, uh, you have a contractor, material suppliers. So the agency doing the quality insurance should be an independent third party who is hired by the owner to check things. However, standards are only feasible when either the material or the product or the activity is uh, generic. So more than one company can make this material. One, more than one company can make the final product. More than one company can install the final product. I mean, for example, of what I'm getting at by installation is uh, the Monitu piles. Well, there used to be only one company that made Monitu piles, but any pile driving contractor could install a Monitu pile. That's, that's what I'm getting at. There's an additional consideration rele that's relevant for EPS geofoam, and that is the uh, function. Uh, in other words, depending on whether you're going to use this for a large or small strain application, you're going to need to have different standards. Again, there is no one-size-fits-all EPS geofoam product. Well, there is no one-size-fits-all geofoam standards. It can't be. I mean, the things that are important to small strain applications, elastic limit stress, things like that, initial Young's modulus, uh, they are not as important in a large strain application where we're looking at what's the stiffness under much larger strain range, not 1%, 30, 40, 50% percent over time, things like that. So the point I'm getting at is that there's a lot of things go into uh, standards. It's, it's not just for one thing or one activity. So with respect to EPS and the different derivative materials I've talked about, like resilient EPS and polystyrene porous block, only EPS block uh, is a generic material and only the full size blocks or panels cut from a block are generic products. And because EPS block could be used for both small and large strain functions, we would need separate standards for these two functions because the operative stiffnesses are so drastically different. So all the other geofoam related materials, products, applications, uh, whether we're using EPS block, uh, sometimes EPS block, although EPS block is a generic material, it can be and has been used as part of a proprietary product. For example, Plastifab, which is a EPS block molder based in Canada and the US, has a product called Geovoid. And it's a proprietary product, but it is made from generic EPS block. 
certainly EPS shape products are generic, resilient EPS, uh, I'm sorry, EPS shape products are proprietary, and uh, resilient EPS is proprietary only because how it's made is not standardized at present. And the same thing with the glued polystyrene porous block. So all of these are GFO materials or products are proprietary in one way or the other, although they do have standardized aspects. I mean, how do we perform a uniaxial rapid loading test? Well, there's a stand ASTM standard for that we could use. If we look at generic materials and products, and this is the one I'm going to elaborate on most, at the present time, at least in the U.S., uh, EPS block is the only generic commodity-related material uh, that has uh, for use in GFO and functional applications. Uh, however, as we've talked about, it can be made with a wide range in load-bearing properties uh, and therefore material quality. It can be made with and without flame retardant beads, with or without insect propellant in the final molding stage. It could use the final blocks as blocks as is or factory cut into uh, different shapes. The reality is is that there's a lot of variation with block molded EPS. It can wind up in a lot of different places, made a lot of different ways with a lot of different quality demands. So this reality, when you combine it with the fact that, as I said early on, the GFO market is not the major sales market for EPS block molders, at least in the U.S. So it's been very difficult. It's been really an uphill battle. Uh, I've been involved in this for over 25 years, and it's been an uphill battle to get objective, emphasis on objective, GFO centric standards for EPS block. And one of the things I've learned is, you know, you hear a lot about consensus standards. A lot of organizations like ASTM like to talk about consensus standards. I want to understand that consensus standards are developed by people who can afford to be part of the consensus. Uh, if you want to be on an ASTM committee that creates a standard, you have to be able to travel to committee meetings, uh, things like that. So it takes financial and time resources to be part of the consensus. I point that out because what it means is that generally only people who are being paid by some company to be on that committee are going to be on that committee. And that's just the reality of, of the way consensus standards are developed. These are not voted on by geotechnical engineers at large, for example. Uh, the bottom line is that the only GFOM-related standards efforts in the U.S. at least you're going to find are using flame retardant EPS block for small strain applications such as lightweight fill, uh, thermal insulation beneath pavements and railway tracks, and other applications like that. This is a document I wrote uh, about eight years ago that it talks about my first-hand experiences with the evolution of generic material standards for block molded EPS for small strain geofoam applications, at least in the U.S. Uh, those are the standards activities with which I am most familiar with, certainly on a first-hand basis. So I'm only going to summarize some of the things I talk about in this research report. The important thing for design professionals especially to know is that there's a real divergence of opinion when it comes to standards for EPS block in small strain functional applications. So if you're a design professional and you're using, look, looking to use EPS block geofoam for a lightweight fill, uh, insulated pavement, things like this, you're going to find two drastically different opinions on this. On the one hand, about 20 years ago, began a federally funded, as a part of an NCHRP research project here in the U.S. So it was funded by the highway interests, 
Uh, it was, I called it zero based because I was part of the research team and we were told to develop a standard for road embankments on soft ground using EPS block geophone. And we started from scratch. We said, okay, what needs to be in this standard? Uh, what's important? Material stiffness, elastic limit stress, things like this, modulus. So it's based on the recognition that in these load bearing small strain applications, elastic limit stress is the most important metric for EPS block. I don't care what the density is. We don't care. I mean, to be quite honest, when we created the standard, we said, look, I don't care how much regrind you want to put in there. As long as the final product can carry the load, you could use as much or as little regrind as you want. So it was not a pre it, it was prescriptive only in the end result. And this was done intentionally. It was to allow an EPS molder to make those decisions. Only an EPS molder knows whether or not it's better for them to use no regrind, 5% regrind, things like that. We, we you know, we, when, you, when you go to specify structural steel, you don't tell a steel mill you know, how much raw ingredient to put into the steel. You say, look, this is what I want the final product to do. How you get there, whether you use all virgin materials, whether you use some scrap steel, I don't care. All I care about is the final product. And that's what this standard was all about. It said, look, I want EPS to have a certain load bearing quality, a certain elastic limit stress, a certain Young's modulus. How you get there, Mr. or Ms. Block Molder, I don't care. All right. It's got to be flame retardant, etc. But it was structured around the load bearing, which made sense because that's what we're most interested in. Uh, the goal was eventually that this would become an AASHTO standard, American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials. And in the U.S., at least, AASHTO standards are more important legally than ASTM standards, at least for the road and highway community. These are the things that highway engineers in the U.S. are governed by. And, and the outcome of this effort was published in two public reports. And uh, these are available if you want to look at them. Uh, this is the complete report, and this document just has the a guideline and recommended standard. I also published a separate research report myself. Uh, and this was just broadening the concept. That standard that I showed you was for road embankments. And this was a more general standard for small strain application using the road embankments as an exemplar. So this covers much the same territory as those two uh, TRB documents I showed you. Well, this standard was not developed in a, in a vacuum. At around the same time, the well-known Big Dig project, the interstate highway project in Boston, Massachusetts was under construction. And this NCHRP standard was used uh, for that project over a period of several years. It was a multi-year project. It involved about a dozen EPS fills. Uh, these were replacing what were supposed to be elevated structures supported on deep foundations, mostly drilled shafts. Very demanding project. These all had to be what we call zero stress fills, meaning you know, there's about 100 feet of soft organic clay under much of the site. So the stress imposed on the ground surface at the bottom of this EPS geofoam fill could not exceed the pre-existing overburden stress. This is what we call a zero net stress design. And we were able to do this. Uh, this just shows one of, as, as I said, about a dozen different uh, fills under construction. And by the way, these fills have now been in place for the better part of 20 years, and as far as I can determine, have been performing just, just fine. Uh, the most significant item to note from the Big Dig project was that the standard that was developed for the NCHRP project was reasonable and realistic. 
There's no ambiguity about that. This was a multi-year project, and during the course of that project, more than one block molder, EPS block molder from the northeastern U.S. supplied this project, and they were each able to meet the standard without any undue hardship or effort. And I'm emphasizing this for a reason. It was a realistic, reasonable standard. You know, but anytime you develop anything from a blank piece of paper, uh, there's always going to be some fine tuning. So yeah, there were a few things we learned from the Big Dig project uh, that we learned to put in here. One of them was the fact that uh, uh, nowadays, because the, the beads can come from around the world and a block molder may change bead supplier during the course of a project, well, you now, now have to include that in the standard that the, bead, that the block molder has to tell you about this and, tell, and provide information about the bead source. So there was a follow-on research uh, NCHRP project using EPS block geofoam uh, for slope stabilization, uh, not necessarily related to soft ground conditions. And this uh, project report that came out about nine years ago had an updated version of the NCHRP standard. So in this NCHRP report, Basically, everything we learned on the Big Dig project for using that standard for several years was included in a new and improved version of the standard here. And I used this standard uh, for the first EPS block geofoam project undertaken by the Idaho DOT. This was rebuilding US Route 30, the old Oregon Trail in Topaz, Bannock County, Idaho. Uh, interesting thing about this project, which was your basic project in the middle of nowhere, beautiful scenery, of course, is that the quote unquote local, local block molder was 1,200 kilometers, 750 miles from the project site. That's why I said earlier <laughs> that uh, EPS is a light but bulky material, so usually the block molder should be as close to the project as possible. But close, is, close and local is in the eyes of the beholder. And in this case, uh, the block molder was actually much farther away. There, were, there was a closer block molder. Uh, to this project, but the, I don't know how they did it, but the block molder was farther away, uh, was a low bidder on the project, uh, produced very high quality. EPS, no, no quarrels about the quality that was produced. But again, local is certainly in the eyes of the beholder. But again, the important point to point out here is that here you had a block molder completely on the other side of the United States. You know, on the big dig, we we're in the northeastern U.S. and this project, the block molder was in the Pacific Northwest. And had no problems meeting the material and product requirements put forth by this NCHRP standard. I keep emphasizing this and highlighting this because there, there are some in the EPS industry that said, well, the EPS st standard's too tough. We can't meet it. Well, you know, if you're gonna make EPS with 40% regrind, you're probably not gonna be able to meet it. But if you wanna make high quality EPS, if you want to practice rocket science, as some EPS molders are very happy to do, you can meet this with no trouble. I'm very pleased and very happy with this Idaho project. Uh, it was featured in ASCE Geotechnical Conference, received awards. You see it was on the cover of a geotech conference back in 2012. Received awards both from the state of Idaho as well as from Road Builder Association. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this project actually separately in my next narrated presentation. Very interesting project. Very, very one of the most challenging EPS geofoam projects I've worked on around the world. Uh, a lot of really significant challenges here. And again, it's, it's its own presentation and I'll talk about this in the next few months. The bottom line is, is that the NCHRP research studies uh, 
produced a very workable standard for EPS block geofoam and small strain applications. This standard was proved by several large scale road projects in the US, Big Dig, Idaho, and several others I didn't mention. It's based on load bearing, the elastic limit stress and material stiffness, not density or some artificial metric like compressive strength, which as I've showed you is completely irrelevant for load bearing in geofoam applications. So it's a standard based on what is important to EPS in small strain geofoam load bearing applications. I have no, I don't know, I can only speculate, and I won't get into that here, as to why the US EPS industry never liked or embraced this standard. They complained about it, they never embraced it. They went out and developed their own ASTM standard that really was just a revised, modest reworking of the decades old ASTM C578, which as I pointed out, was for non-load bearing above ground thermal insulation applications. So the current ASTM standard you see for quote unquote geofoam applications is just really a slightly modified version of what existed for non-load bearing applications and unfortunately continues to use material density as the primary material property for EPS block geofoam. And hopefully I've been successful in showing you that EPS density per se is irrelevant for load-bearing geofoam applications. Well, the bottom line is, is that as a design professional in the United States at the present time you have, or worldwide, uh, unless you have a Euro standard that you have to follow or something like that, uh, but certainly here in the U.S. practice, uh, you, under, the design professional, unfortunately has to make the final choice. It's your professional engineer's uh, license on the line here as to which is two standards to use. I will just tell you that uh, there are cost implications for a project in terms of how much the EPS is gonna cost. Uh, this is because the material standards for these two standards are quite a bit different. And I think that's enough said on this. Uh, just to wrap things up, to briefly talk about proprietary material and products. While small strain functional applications dominate the EPS block geofoam market. I've shown you that there are other materials and products uh, such as resilient EPS and glued polystyrene porous block as well as others I haven't mentioned that are proprietary in one way or another. Uh, shape products, resilient polystyrene porous block. Uh, although certainly how we test these materials and products are certainly standardized and we can make use of those standards. But the bottom line is when you're dealing with one of these or other geofoam products based on expanded polystyrene in one way or another, the manufacturer who makes that product is going to tell you what the material properties are and either uh, you take it or leave it, all right, because these are manufacturer says, look, this is how I make this material a product. This is what I have to offer. Um, so there, there is no standard for that. Again, you, it's going to be on a product specific basis. And with that, I'm going to bring this presentation to a close. And I want to say thank you very much uh, for those of you who have listened to the entire presentation. Uh, it certainly has actually turned out being longer than I thought. Um, but this is uh, geofoams or something I've been working with for over 30 years. And uh, obviously there are a number of topics, uh, especially with material properties that are near and dear to my heart. I think geofoams in general and EPS geofoams in particular are really intriguing materials that add a lot to the geotechnical engineer's toolbox simply because they have functional applications that no other geosynthetic can provide. Uh, so it distresses me when I see these EPS materials and products used incorrectly, improperly, uh, when we have needless failures because people did not take the time
to learn about the relevant, important engineering properties. So I hope the few hours you've spent listening to this presentation are a few hours well spent because uh, hopefully it will help you in your future, either if you're a design professional, your future projects, if you're an academic in your academic research. So for your patience and perseverance and listening to my presentation, I will share with you a secret that I've learned in the last 33 years working with EPS. Of course, we've all seen uh, Atlas depicted holding up the world. Uh, one of the things I've learned is that in reality, it is an assemblage of EPS blocks that is holding up Atlas. So with that, I will bring this presentation to a close. And again, once again, say thank you very much.